Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 40th anniversary of the Woodson Center. I'm Kelly Wright. I'll be your host tonight for this wonderful event that I am humbled and honored to be a part of because of the work that the Woodson Center has accomplished in the last 40 years. And that is why we are here. It has made and continues to make huge impacts on our communities across the United States, and you'll see tonight also globally. It's really important, ladies and gentlemen, that we be excited about what's unfolding here because it's what I like to call good news taking place in the bad news world. So it gives me pleasure to share this event with you tonight. The evening will be packed with community leaders, scholars, contributors, and educators, all telling their great story of the Whitson Center's programs and initiatives that have saved lives and changed neighborhoods everywhere that they've worked. So it gives me great pleasure now to introduce the man of the hour, Mr. Bob Woodson. Bob, good to see you, buddy. Good seeing you. It's, Why are we here? We're here because as a, when I was a young civil rights activist, I realized that when the doors of opportunity opened deep with desegregation, uh, many of the people who suffered and sacrificed most did not benefit from the change. I remember a picketing outside of a pharmaceutical company, and when they desegregated, they'd hired nine black PhD chemists, and mm -hmm. we asked them to join our movement. They said they got the jobs because they were qualified, not because of the janitors and hairdressers and factory workers who were putting in all the work. After a couple times, I realized I was in the wrong struggle, and the civil rights movement was beginning to morph into a race grievance industry, and then the poverty programs came along where they spent $22 trillion with 70 cents going not to the poor, but those who say, serve the poor. They ask which problems are fundable, not which ones <coughs> are, are solvable. And so I realized that poor people, man, uh, that I'm in the wrong struggle, that I need to be uh, reaching out and helping poor people of all races who are locked out because, because Dr. King said, what, what good does it do that lead in a restaurant of your choice if you don't have the means to exercise the right. So it's not enough to have opportunity. You must be prepared to walk through the doors of opportunity. So the, the Woodson Center was established to, to, be an, to assist low-income leaders to walk through the doors of opportunity by preparing themselves. So if I'm hearing you correctly, then first of all, thank you for answering the call that God placed on your life. Uh, but if I hear you correctly, you are living a purpose-driven life to develop hope and faith and love in the lives of everyone that you've touched. In other words, you're, you're inviting everyone, marginalized and forgotten, to have that seat at the table of brotherhood. I really, really am, and that's what I'm saying. It's, it's real unity. I think right now with the, with the tribal warfare that's going on, the emphasis on race, America doesn't have a race problem, it has a grace problem. Hmm. And, and so that grace problem can only by serve by going in uh, to these communities and equipping and empowering those who have most to gain from being empowered, that we have an upward mobility problem. And therefore, the purpose of the center is to deracialize race and desegregate poverty. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I have a feeling that throughout this night, we will be saying that word quite a bit, thank you. And, and showing you some gratitude. So that's it, that's why we are here. It's for a purpose uh, mm -hmm. beyond Bob Woodson, it's a purpose beyond the Woodson Center, it's a purpose beyond us and those of us that you'll hear from. But it's a purpose that you can be a part of. And before we get into this wonderful event, the 40th anniversary of the Woodson Center, let's begin with first of all, thanking God that we are here and praying for each and every one of you who are watching. And Secondly, let's give tribute to the United States of America that has produced a great citizen in Bob Woodson. And we do that by first uh, having our national anthem. And to perform the national anthem, it will be by Urban Nation's Ashley Brown, accompanied by Ricky Payton, the musical director of Urban Nation Academy for the Performing Arts. Please welcome as we stand here for the na national anthem. i 
And for those of you at home, I hope you're applauding that wonderful performance of the national anthem by Ashley Brown, accompanied by uh, a very talented uh, musician as well as the musical director, Ricky Payton, musical director of Urban Nation Academy for the Performing Arts here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. Well, Bob, uh, I could almost say that this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get things started by going back to the 1960s, 1960s through the 70s. We'll start with that decade and show each and every one of you at home and throughout the world uh, a glimpse of what it was like as a young Bob Woodson set out to do exactly what he meant to do, and that's reach out to the least of these. Let's watch and learn. Founded in 1981, the Woodson Center empowers community-based leaders to promote solutions to reduce crime and violence, restore families, revitalize underserved communities, and assist in the creation of economic enterprise. Founder Bob Woodson led with the radical idea that every single person can be a source of innovation and positive change, regardless of income or zip code. Tonight, you'll hear some inspiring stories that have transformed lives and communities across America. If you want to know why the Woodson Center is committed to upward mobility and neighborhood enterprise, then you have to understand what my father observed in the early days of the civil rights movement. At just 25 years old, he had become a vice president of his local NAACP chapter and chairman of the Human Relations Council. Yet he found himself disagreeing with some of the older leaders from these movements. He called it the elitism of black leadership and wrote, those in established circles of leadership did not credit low income people with having the ability to understand the needs of their own community. More and more, he saw that these leaders rarely asked for the ideas and input of less educated, lower income blacks whose suffering was the greatest. For the most part, the only time they were called upon was to provide bodies for a demonstration. Segregation in housing was really an important issue at the time. White landlords refused to rent apartments to blacks. So after some negotiation was not successful, we organized a demonstration. We took a busload of people and picketed outside of the head of the Westchester Board of Realtors home on a Sunday afternoon. Well, that got their attention, and after a while, we saw a change in their practices. The same with the issue of segregation. Westchester had the segregated school system, and, and also the system was, didn't play the same amount of money were spent on low-income black neighborhood schools. And so we met with the chairman of the school board who said, oh, I, we don't believe that Woodson and his small band of radicals represent the Westchester black community, we know our people. So we took his statement, we know our people, and put it on picket signs, and we organized over a thousand protesters who stood silently on the steps of the courthouse in Westchester. And then finally, after that protest, they conceded, they hired a black principal, and also they moved to desegregate the schools. And that's a glimpse of the 60s and 70s, a video highlight of Bob's entry into this great work that you have been doing for all of these years. And you know, the 60s was a very pivotal time for so many Americans. We had uh, the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy as he was running for the presidency to fill the shoes that his uh, assassinated brother had left vacant. Uh, we also saw a, a movement with the civil rights struggle uh, culminate in the voting rights legislation. Uh, so the work, the great work that uh, so many people had begun under uh, Dr. King's leadership, and you were part of that, 
it really showed a lot of ability in America, but at the same time, we were confronted with so much change from the heartbreak of poverty. Uh, when you look back over that period and realize that we could send rockets to the moon, have a man walk on the moon, yet we still had a problem here at home and seeing eye to eye with our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I remember that's, I was about ready to leave the civil rights movement at that time when the riots occurred in Westchester and I got a call, I was about 10 miles away and I rushed back to the city and, uh, and I took to the streets. But, and, and what I did though, and this is when I realized the importance of grassroots leaders, when I tried to intervene and try, I, I, I identified 10 neighborhood leaders, a bartender, a janitor, and um, a factory worker, and these were friends of mine in the community, and I told them to get in the cars until we physically interceded ourselves between the National Guard and the police and the rioters. Mm. And because these neighborhood leaders had trust and confidence of people, we got in the front of them and told them to stop, and so we didn't lose any life. And I realized at that moment that the real power is on, in the streets. It is among the people who share the same zip code with those experience. And it also emphasized that the crisis is a lot of those poor blacks were rioting, were not a part of the civil rights movement, nor were our, our initiatives to improve conditions helping the poor. And so it further reinforced this notion of mine that poor blacks were not being served, and that's why the frustration uh, uh, developed into riots. And so it, it I just reinforced the notion that we must empower those that have the kind of influence uh, on the streets. And so I, it, it caused me to just migrate further away from the traditional leadership and recognize that the power of changing communities lies within the people experiencing the problem. So you took the war on poverty to the streets through the people in the neighborhoods who could help facilitate the change. Yes, but government was not funding them. Yeah. They were funding yeah. the experts, the professionals in the universities who were designing programs to parachute in. Yeah. And so that has been a persistent problem over the course of four decades. I've been pushing back against that. Uh, and so that's why uh, the Lewiston Center uh, has been, that's what motivated me to start it and that's what motivates me to continue it to this day. The people with the solutions are not the ones with the money. <laughs> well said, my friend, well said. Uh, there, there's a lot of going on today, as you know. We live in a selfie generation. So we have some selfies for you tonight, except these selfies are actually testimonials uh, from men and women who appreciate the work that's been done through the Woodson Center. And we'll begin with our selfie number one, Gregory L. Snyder. Let's listen. Congratulations to the Woodson Center on your 40th anniversary. It has been my privilege to have known my good friend Bob Woodson for over 20 years. I represented my company, HSBC Bank, in supporting center initiatives over the years. And beyond my retirement, I have served on the board of directors for years, and now it's my honor to serve as its chair. I have witnessed firsthand the amazing work of the Woodson Center affiliates and the positive impact that they have had on their communities. Today we need the Woodson Center and the Woodson Principles more than ever and their unique focus on finding solutions to today's most pressing problems. Congratulations on the positive impact that you have had on so many lives to date and in the years to come. Thank wow. you. And uh, Greg Snyder, he, he's an example of responsible philanthropy. HSBC Bank invested $5 million uh, in the center that enabled us to work in, in Lowndes County, Alabama. And with that five, uh, a million a year for five years, we hired local leaders, Catherine Flowers, she hired all local staff. We were able to build the uh, county's first recreation center. We helped with economic development put into uh, two-tier uh, commercial centers, industrial centers, uh, Hyundai, 
that hired local people. So Greg Snyder, his company, and Citibank also, uh, Martin Wong, brought Citibank to the table, and we took people out of uh, homes that were roofs were falling in and put them in new double-wide trailers. Uh, so it's, that's the kind of philanthropy that the Woodson Center attracted. And you call it responsible philanthropy. Responsible, creative philanthropy. Which goes a lot deeper than just charitable philanthropy. Exactly. It's intended to empower, not to disable. Very good. Well, we'll now bring your attention to the uh, 70s and 80s, if you will. Uh, another highlight reel of what's been going on with the Whitson Center since Bob launched this uh, so many years ago. Let's watch and learn from the 70s to the 80s. As the dawn of a new decade drew near, Bob Woodson's approach of listening to the leaders of lower income communities didn't change. It deepened and matured to meet new opportunities and challenges. In the early 70s in Philadelphia, it was the youth gang capital of the country at 48 gang deaths a year. They listed it right next to the Vietnam deaths. Well, an enterprising couple, David and Falaka Fata, found that the oldest of their six sons was a gang member. She invited him to bring his 15 friends home. They moved into their house, and as a result, word circulated that there was sanctuary. The young men retired her mortgage in a few years and purchased five other houses on that neighborhood, and they had 100 young men from all over the city living peacefully they expanded to the entire city, and as a consequence, youth gang violence went down from 48 in uh, 1974 down to two a year. The Woodson Center Public Housing Pilot changed the world of welfare policies related to low-income residents, showing as they trained in 12 sites across the country that residents could be their own owners and managers such as Kimmy Gray here in the District of Columbia, Kenilworth, Parkside. They had already sent over 600 young people to colleges, took over management of the property, becoming their own maintenance men and renovators and managers, and according to an independent accounting firm, saved taxpayers millions of dollars, increased rental collections 77%, and cut crime and welfare dependency in half. Congress took note. With the help of the center, amendments were crafted to the Housing Act in 1987, sponsored by Jack Kemp, Walter Fontroy, Republican and Democrat, that passed 419 to 1, giving residents the right to manage and own their own housing and reinvest surplus revenues in their own community enterprises. Wonderfully done, the 1970s through the 80s. And Bob, something that I noted in, in that piece, uh, in the graph towards the end, was the mention of what took place in combating apartheid in South Africa, which tells all of us that not only was the Whitson Center concerned about what was happening in this country, but it was also dealing with issues abroad globally. Talk to me about that real quickly. Well, real quickly, uh, the IBM Corporation gave us the money uh, since they saw we were successfully training grassroots people to take control of their communities here. They said they have a problem in South Africa. So uh, we were going over, went over there and met uh, grassroots leaders in South Africa in the homelands and um, found the same grassroots leaders that were in the urban communities over there and we successfully trained them um, and uh, helped them to uh, take charge of their neighborhood and other an empowerment strategy. So we were very pleased. So the village was reaching out to the whole world at that time. And uh, here now uh, joining us are three gentlemen who know a little bit about uh, Whitson Center and about Philadelphia and about how redemption works and how to overcome the problems that we have. And I like that part about how redemption works how we can redeem the soul of mankind uh, from the hood and get people to do some good. We have Carl Hardwick, 
Gary Wyatt and Willie Peterson. Bob, you'll take it from here. Yeah, well, I was, uh, the, the Woodson Center was invited to come into Ohio to conduct a conference to link grassroots leaders to the, the government welfare office so they can better think. And I had a conference and these two guys sneaked in. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> Gary Wyatt and Willie Peterson because the local organization that we had relied on, to, they gave us the urban league types and middle class people. And because Gary Wyatt asked a question from the back, I knew that he was what I was looking for. So I sort of moved the other people off and told Willie Peterson and Gary Wyatt to come up on the stage. And, and they were, Gary has a book called From Dealing to Healing, if you know what that means. Yeah. They, <laughs> Gary, it was a, an example of a Joseph that did ride on a stolen bike, uh, but had been redeemed. Willie Peterson also came from that troubled background. But Carl was not. Carl was in poverty, but not of it. It shows you that not all leaders are, are, have X's in front of their names. Uh, and so, and Carl is affectionately known as the mayor of the ghetto of Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> well, each of them are close friends and just stellar examples of people who risk their lives every day to serve their people. And I wish, uh, starting with Willie, you would just share a little with the time we have of uh, why you do what you do and what impact is having in that community. Thank you for having me and it's great to be here. Uh, I'm in Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown. And in Youngstown, you know, if, if anybody watches the news, it has a pretty negative uh, connotation especially after the steel mills left many years ago, we had a population of, in Youngstown of over 250,000 people when I grew up. The whole county doesn't have that many now. Mm. And so when I came back home to Youngstown, there was a murder in the neighborhood and the police were looking to get more money to buy guns and to do their thing. And I went to the mayor in a, mayor, in a city council meeting and I said, well, why are we not putting money into the neighborhood to help them? Uh, to strengthen them, and it uh, didn't work. And the next thing I know, Bob's in Akron, he's in Columbus, and uh, we started following, listening to um, his message, and I became a disciple because I understood uh, that we need to do healing from the neighborhood point of view. And I, as a pastor, I'm a pastor in Youngstown, I understood the Joseph theory, and I went back home to Youngstown under the Nehemiah theory but I became a Joseph real fast. And <laughs> pl 20 plus years later, I'm still learning and I'm honored to be here and to serve and to learn from such a great man as Mr. Bob Woodson. Thank you. Brother Carl, briefly. Yeah. Put the microphone up. Carl Carl. Hybrid, uh, Put the microphone up. I met, I met Bob in the 70s. <laughs> and uh, he was in New York with Urban League. And what happened was he was holding a game conference. <laughs> and in that game conference, they asked me to come down. I didn't know Bob. And I brought some young people with me. <clears throat> and as we sat around, Sister Polaka Fatal was there mm -hmm. and talking about the game problem. Hartford is Connecticut's third richest state in, in the country. Hartford is the fourth poorest city in the country. So we was round wealth, we didn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> but it was multitude of problems. And Bob, someone had told Bob about this dude that went into Hartford, a gang with Steve Holter in the Magnificent 20s. They were like 1,500 strong. And uh, there was another gang up in Stowe Village, Hustlers. And how I was mediating that, how I got to them, in terms of uh, looking at what was happening in the neighborhood and just going by and someone said there's a gang problem, going to a community meeting, people were scared to come out. And when they went out, they were scared to come back. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met Steve in Bellevue Square in the project. And I said, Steve, man, who's working with you? And he says, nobody. I said, well, we need to do some work. And that was my beginning of working with them. Now, once you make that commitment to games, you got to be there when they call you. So if they call you two, two o'clock in the morning, you can't say, well, my office hours is 8.30 to three. No, you made a commitment. I was always there for them. And based on that, we were able to hook up 
with Bob Woodson, Sister Falaka Fatah, uh, Fat Rob, and we sat back and seeing how these, they didn't know each other, but how much they had in common in terms of what they were going through. And Fat Rob would come to Hartford, Steve would go, go to Philly, and uh, it just continue on working with Bob to all the way up to the Latin Kings, uh, Leon, Crips, and Bloods, mm. you know, Savage Nomads. But I, rem I remember there was an incident that happened at the Urban League. We were having a problem with killings mm -hmm. in Hartford. And it was the Ghetto Brothers and the Savage Nomads. Yeah. One group that we didn't work with because they were primarily in the South. And, and I was talking about, man, I don't know why. I, I'm talking to them dudes down there. I'm not getting anywhere. And one of the dudes in the meeting said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Mm. And next you know, we came back. That killing stopped right there. Mm. Well, we so what happened was what Bob has done, which is great when you go with Big Bird, Genie, mm. all those kids that have been successful, he exposed them. He took them out of the hood right. and began to show them a different way of life. And just based on those conversations around the table, they were able to change their lives. Good. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Gary, uh, just a short version. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl took up all my time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you should never invite me. <laughs> fast forward, fast forward it. Uh, you know, after my conversion to Jesus Christ and being delivered from crack cocaine, smoking $1,200 a week, you know, we wanted to do something. We wanted to make some changes in the community. You know, there was a lot of crime going on in, and we got messed around. Like I said, after the welfare reform, we got a hold of one of Bob's books, and Bob came, you know, didn't charge us, came to Akron, Ohio, Peterson and all them came down, and he did an event, and he was just saying what works and why, and how to solve, solve a lot of the community issues with the people that you already got in the neighborhood. In the, in the modern day Joseph, any of y'all read the story of Joseph, he became great within his own family and, and his own community. So with Bob, after we started a community house, Bob and them, the center perfected what we did. They attached us to the, the pharaohs of the world, you know, the funders, mm -hmm. while we was the Joseph, we got the know-how, but they got the what and the resources. And that's what he did, he connected us and informed us, you know, to the point where, you know, we look at now, you know, once we was a part of the problem, now we became part of the solution over the years. Good. So, but that's just many of the things that uh, Bob, and one of the phrases I always remember him saying, your talent could take you to the White House, but only your character and your integrity could keep you. And that stuck with us hmm. for years. And here it is 23 hmm. years later, we still serving the Lord, still fighting a good fight of faith. And, you know, every time I get on this stage and see all these people, guys that's a little bit older, I mean, it's just an encouragement. Watch yourself. You know, <laughs> it's an encouragement. Even after 25, 30 years, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, can I just have a break? But then when I look at Carl, when I look at Pastor Peterson and Bob, who got who's 80 something years old, it's like the Lord was like, when he told Joe, where were you when I created the heavens and earth? You ain't done until I call you done. So just wanted to finish with that. Well, bless you. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you. And uh, I mean, I was stunned when you said, how much was that cocaine? $1,200 in? I was snorting a week. And with God, you uh, you get a, a spiritual and emotional and physical high for free. Yes, and been clean for 20 some years. So you went from dealing to healing. Yes, and my sons never saw that side of me. All they can do is read about it. <laughs> That's a good thing. All they can do is read about it. Never, never go through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, character. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, thank for you. joining us and for the great work that you're doing in your respective cities and how you're collaborating together. It's, it's wonderful how uh, you're holding the glue together with love and with freedom and with peace and telling your story. I want to thank you so much for coming here to share uh, your experiences with Bob Woodson and on this 40th anniversary of the Woodson Center. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Carl Hardwick, Gary Wyatt, and Willie Peterson. 
There's more to come, and we're going to begin right now by showing you what was going on in Bob's life in the 90s. As you've heard from these three gentlemen, they have been with Bob all those years that they actually met him, and it hasn't stopped. So these friendships grow deep, and we'll talk about the 90s now as we look at the video of what was going on during that time. Let's watch and learn. As the decade closed, Thanks. it was clear you, that the nation needed a new approach to curb the violence in so many communities of color across the country. That approach would soon become codified in three simple words, violence-free zones. A Bennett Terrace was considered to be one of the most dangerous places in the District of Columbia. It was a war zone where the kids was killing each other for little or nothing. Life didn't mean a thing in Ben and Terrace. We went into Ben and Terrace and began the transformation. The Woodson Center came in with us and began to navigate the roadmap, began to create concepts that we could utilize to be able to obtain our end results, which was transformation of the community, building the community, lifting the community. And from that particular point, life was blown into the balanced free zone, which became an initiative of transformation for the community, public health for the community, public safety for the community, uplifting transformation in regards to people, jobs, opportunity, training for the people. The Neighborhood Leadership Development Institute uh, is a program that initially trained 320 community-based organizations located in roughly 22 states, and we would provide them with 16 days of concentrated training in organizational development, community development, resource development, and partnership development. As a result of the community-based leaders' participation in the Neighborhood Leadership Development Institute, uh, at least 30% of them have gone on and grown their business, grown their nonprofit organizations to a sustainable level. The genesis of the Achievement Against the Odds Awards, I think Bob Woodson was troubled by what he saw of people who were being celebrated for being movie stars or politicians, and he felt that the real heroes of our society are really in low-income neighborhoods who 24 hours a day are living with terrible problems but who step up and are trying to find solutions. And so he set up a program to bring them to Washington to what he called low-income Oscars night, not only to reward them but and show that they were models for the whole country, but also to help uh, make them seen in their own communities and hopefully that their own cities would then support them uh, with the things that they needed to do their programs. Bob, I gotta ask, low income Oscars night? Yes, sir. And the winner goes <laughs> and the statue goes to the heroes and sheroes of the community. That was a brilliant uh, adaptation and a great idea. And you talked about at the end of that, or at least we saw at the end of that, what our previous panel had discussed, and that was modern day Josephs. And we've got a whole panel of Josephs uh, here as well. Uh, let me introduce some real quickly, Bob, and you can talk about how government working with grassroots leaders like these modern day Josephs can help change a neighborhood legacy, legacy, legacy. Uh, Terrence Mathis, Ed Harris, Petey Monroe, Derek Ross, Tyrone Parker. Gentlemen, it's good to meet all of you tonight, but this gentleman knows you all very well, so <laughs> I will let Bob take over from here. Well, I want Terrence to also join me in the introduction because Terrence is my former vice president for over 20 years and has really been the, the, the administrator uh, and supervisor of all of this. So my name was at the top, but Terrence was in there 
and then, so I want him to also participate. But uh, as, as, as Tyra, we said, when Bene Terrace is one of the most infamous neighborhoods anywhere in the country, and um, we didn't think any kind of change could occur. But the Alliance of Concerned Men did what no one else did. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Tyrone to talk about what happened and then introduce uh, our, our panelists. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here, Bob, uh, to celebrate the extraordinary work that you have done. As I look at you and how you look at all of us, it's like a proud father that <laughs> elevates the spirit <laughs> of human mankind, Bob. So I'm thankful to be here. But not only, Bob, did you open the door, you showed individuals how to sustain it and to continue on the walk. When we went into Benitez, as you know, it was considered one of the most dangerous places in the District of Columbia. We had the spirit, but you had the directions. So many people out today have spirits, but they do not have directions. You came with the, with the guiding light and added the resources and touched everybody's life that's on here that have helped to transform them to today. That, if that's not God's work, you tell me what it is. Mm -hmm. You've been a blessing, Bob, and you continue to be the man that I met that day and the man that I know today. You are my friend, and I love you. Mm -hmm. Well, I love these guys. I can't pretend to be some objective moderator because I knew these guys when they were going, but I'd like to ask each of them, um, what was life like before and, and why did you make the decision to kind of change and be the kind of successful men and fathers and, and husbands and that you are today? Uh, Edward, you want to start? Just Hello, my name is... Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> first, I'd like to you know, thank you for just bringing me here, thinking of me special enough to be on this panel, first oh, yeah. and foremost. Uh, you know, the other guys, and some of them, we come up together but I think when the initiative Ms. Foster Hill was murdered in our community, East Capitol Dwellings, she was protecting her grandkids from a shootout that was occurring in the neighborhood. And Bob and some of the uh, other government entities came in and asked the community what did they want, what did they need. So through housing and Mr. Wilson, they provided jobs and things and then still asked them what else can change the community. So the guys in the community was like, you know, we would like to have a football team. At the time, I was working at Washington Overlook. So the guys told Mr. Wilson and Curtis Washington, there's a guy named Edward Harris, which is me, that was a football star that got the pulse of the community. So Curtis and the guys reached out and found me, and they offered me an opportunity to give back to, to the community. And one of the things was, you know, Mr. Wilson and Curtis, I knew I had something, but they made me inspired to bring that gift out that I had. Mm -hmm. And the gift was to reach the masses. Mm -hmm. And that I can talk on this stage and still talk in the hood. <laughs> and the credibility is still good. Mm -hmm. So through that process, we started, I think, 2001. And I had my first football team. We had started a football organization with four teams from age of 10 to 15. And it's crazy when I got the call from your media person the following week, this weekend coming, August the 6th, I was asked to be in one of my football players' wedding this weekend. Mm, wow. Well, congratulations. Weekend. Mm -hmm. And he just sent me a text and was, he still called me coach and he's 30. And he was like, coach, I want you to give a speech at my wedding. So that alone is like it mm -hmm. all timed up at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently now coaching football at Ron Brown All Boys High mm -hmm. School in Washington, D.C. And I work in D.C. public schools. Mm -hmm is one of the supervisors of the food service department, which I've been currently doing 13 years. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's been a journey. We, we kind of sort of lost connection around 2006, but it wasn't a lost connection. Mm -hmm. It was just you manually check back in. That's right. They checked in on me right. and they constantly watched my journey. That's right. And you That's know, right. that journey has brought me full circle here of being a committed husband, Mm -hmm. I can proudly say, mm -hmm. you know, I have four children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there still on a daily basis giving this knowledge back to the community, mm -hmm. not just, you know, through the center. It was initiative through the center to give that motivation that constantly 
has me doing it now. So in the community where we at now is Marvin Gaye Park, which was known as Wash Branch. So the police in that community, we have no issues. Mm -hmm. We mingle, they mm -hmm. come to the games, we have a tournament going on down there presently, Monday through Friday, where's that? The police allow us, the police our community. There's no rift, mm -hmm. it's great communication. Mm -hmm. There's no black mm -hmm. white issue, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Two of the main cops that we see on a regular basis mm -hmm. is a you know a Caucasian white lady mm -hmm. and a white guy that mm -hmm. we deal with on a regular basis that mm -hmm. we communicate with every That's day. Right. That's right. Know my wife, know my family. Mm -hmm. So you know, some days when I watch, I watch TV and I see the dysfunction in the communities about the police relations, and I think to myself, I'm like, wow, we don't have that mm -hmm. in the community where we at. And I think that's because we made a conscious effort to make that arrangement and that thing like a community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we worked with Chief Ramsey back then at the time mm -hmm. when he was the, uh, the chief of police back in the early 2000s. So it carried on over. Mm -hmm. So it was numbers of police that we did relationships with. Mm -hmm. They helped out in the community mm -hmm. that we still got relationships with. That's today. wonderful. So Thank all you. in all, it's been, mm -hmm. it's been a good journey that's going to continue. Thank you. That's a great piece, man. Derek. <laughs> Lean in? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Thomas Derek Ross. And what was life like? What was that, 97? Yes, sir. Yeah. It, well, 97 when it was initially. They came through in 98. Mm -hmm. And life in Ben and Terrace was ours. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that went on in Benatars, the community is who controlled everything. You know, we didn't have police, we didn't have no muggings, we didn't have no houses being broken into because the community was it. We basically controlled the entire neighborhood. It was ours. You know, and us being out there, I watched Benatars go from what was supposed to have been the modern public housing till it became just basically, it was Iraq. You know, crack epidemic hit and it hit Ben and Terrace hard. You know, most people hear stories about open air drug markets where we lived it. You know, you come outside with trash bags of drugs. We had all the money, cars, guns. We had everything except for direction. Mm. Mm -hmm. What we were doing was we was learning from other young people. The old head said they are too crazy. I'm not even <laughs> dealing with them. <laughs> so we learned from each other. Mm -hmm. Blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. All we knew was when. And it really didn't matter who Ooh or what, or where they were. We just knew we had to win. And I started seeing a younger and younger group getting into what we were doing. And I was young. I'm like, I was only like 18. Mm -hmm. But when I started seeing 13, 14 year olds trying to get out there and do what we doing and who are we to say, you can't? Nobody stopped us from doing it. So it's like, yeah, you right and you wrong for letting them do it, but it's the way that the neighborhood is. Mm -hmm. It's the way the neighborhood was. Mm -hmm. Benatar said, Simple City had gotten into so many beefs with so many different neighborhoods till it became a point where though we were literally okay with every neighborhood besides Eastgate. Eastgate was the only one because they had pretty much the same composition. Mm -hmm. They were okay with all the other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But we had went through so many different battles that it became a point where we imploded on ourselves. You know how they say mm -hmm. you can get so high mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the top where though you looking to your left and to your right, and all you're seeing is yourself. <laughs> That's what it was. And who was ourself? The Avenue. 
Mm -hmm. Then you got the avenue in the circle going at each other like you'd have thought that it was a 10 mile distance between the two. And it was only a hundred, how, how, how big is the valley? About a hundred yards? Mm -hmm. Five blocks. Mm -hmm. 140 yards. 140 football field. <laughs> football field. That's the only thing separating the two sides. And we going at each other like we didn't even know each other. I mean, we used to literally sleep on each other couches, but yet we sitting there going to full war, all out war with each other. And it got to the point where though, I knew that it wasn't gonna be a good outcoming from it. So my mama used to always say I was morbid for thinking like this. But I used to just like take a picture every week because I didn't want to have an old, when he was good, picture on my obituary. Mm -hmm. Because I knew I was going. Because mm -hmm. my mindset was, go, you got to win. And you can't, you can't have go, because I never liked that old saying of, you know, teeter tottering on that fence. Because that's the quickest way to get it. You teach her, either you're in it or you're out of it. And if you're in it, like my father always told me, whatever you're going to do, whether it's good or bad, be the best at it. Mm -hmm. so what, what, what changed it? We have to move on, but tell us what changed it. What changed it was when you had Tyrone, Rico, Matt, and Eric. Wow. who kept pestering me. <laughs> they wouldn't stop. They would keep coming up there every night. And they wouldn't come through the daytime. You know, daytime, they, it, was, it was like they knew. Coming through daytime, they ain't learning nothing from that. So they would come at night. When we out there, like, I wish they hurry up and leave so we can go up here and shoot. I wish they hurry up and leave. And then they, they just kept coming, kept coming. So it was like, well, maybe... This is, to me, it was like maybe this is that opportunity. Put your trust in somebody else mm. that mm -mm. it could be a, a, a better outcome of it than we was either dying or we was going to jail for the rest of our lives. And they gave us that little pause where everybody could stop, reflect, mm -hmm. and think about it. Now, I had some friends who decided they didn't want to, but they didn't bother us about it. Mm -hmm. You know, they let us do what we wanted to do. If y'all want to do that, go ahead. And that little pause is what a lot of neighborhoods now need. Ooh. Somebody to give them that little pause, mm -hmm. whereas though they can step back mm -hmm. and make a decision. That's right. Without that pause, that's right. You just it's just gonna continue on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. All right, Derek. Mm -hmm. Terrence, you want to? Yeah. First, uh, <clears throat> Bob, I wanna. I want to thank you for not just allowing me to take part in this uh, wonderful occasion and bringing together such wonderful individuals who, who has transformed the lives of so many, even at the risk of their own lives or whatever. But I also uh, want to stay on script. And uh, I want to say to you that I owe you a profound uh, gratitude of debt for your a uh, strong vision, your unwavering courage, and your belief in people and the people that are represented here. I, I think that I heard a recurring theme across all of these gentlemen here, and the common element here was trust. And as we're seeing the explosion of violence among young people all across this great nation of ours, and we're seeing all of these external solutions that are being put in place, shot cameras and this and that. No one is talking about the, the, the profound impact of love and trust in eradicating this senseless genocide that we're all experiencing in this country. And until we start to look at the enemy within, those things that are driving this kind of behavior and dismissing the strength of what's represented here tonight on this particular stage, we're gonna to continue to see the kind of carnage that has had a grip on this country. We've seen it 
for years and years, it's almost like people think this is something that is new, that we've seen this upsurge, you know, post um, the last couple of months or whatever, but this has been here. These men that is represented here tonight, they're lifers, as Bob talks about all day. They've committed their life to this. And I just wanna thank you for believing in them when others have turned their heads away from them. Petey, why don't you tell us about your journey there? My journey, man, it was, uh, it was my vision, like, like Dirk and, you know, Dink said, you know, our vision was cloudy, man. I didn't, I never think that we would be here, man. Uh, so just going through life, you know, finding God first helped. So what Bob and them did was help change the norm in us and, you know, showed us something different. A lot of uh, communities now, you know, I think they need to go back to these roots to stop what's going on because we got it, the violence is occurring around our city and you got different government officials, everybody, it's about the money. I mean, it takes money to do, to stop the violence, keep people busy, man, you know, and, and that's what they did with us. So I take every, everything that he showed us, man, I still carry the torch as of now, you know, we working with a Cure the Streets initiative over in Benin, you know, we actually covering we have, I have a team of of ten people from 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 the community, and uh, we're the only War Seven site as of now. But uh, we're just trying to d detect the problem, you know. Talk to the guys that we know that you know you get high headed. A lot of them just want somebody to talk to, man, and and that's what they gave us. You know, at first none none of the guys trusted them. Thought that you know Tyrone and them was the police or whatever. That's always been a big thing in our communities. You know these guys police, but when you you know do your research and study and you find out you know there's some people that's really out here that really want to help you. So when you run across people such as Bob Wilson, Tyrone Parkers, Rico Rush, you know I can go on. You know U turns, Curtis Watkins. These guys see vision with though they want to help you change. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So what they did with us, they led us and we drunk our own water. And now, you know, like I say, we, we here now as grown men still constantly carrying the torch, giving back to the lot of, a lot of the youth, you know, helping them with things, you know, trying to find them resources. So it's hard out here in the city, but we need more programs like what Mr. Wilson and them established for us back in the early 90s now. Listen, I want to thank you all. I mean, uh, we wanted to extend this one because I'd like to have you for two hours <laughs> because the answers to urban violence is not ending systemic racism. Right. It's building from within. You mm -hmm. all have I, just one final comment. I remember when they had the football teams and the community where everybody used to run from them ran out. The, the community was packed. Yeah, we, had, we still and, have that. Uh, the, these guys said that the kids were behaving themselves and they were with them, but not with, with their mothers or with teachers. So they required the kids to get a behavioral card signed every Friday night or they couldn't practice and be alone in the team. And the mothers and the teachers said, the only control I have over my kids are this paper. And that's because they exerted the kind of moral authority. And that's how you reduce urban violence. There, there are thousands of grassroots leaders like these around the country. And the Woodson right. Center is committed to identifying them, resourcing them, and creating islands of peace throughout this nation. And that's what we are, uh, the Woodson Center is, is all about. And thank you so much. Bob. Thank you. One of the things that I'd like to say is that when we went into Ben and Terrors, and the people say, why did you all listen to the Alliance? And I recall so clearly they, they stated, because nobody else came. And that's the challenge today. Nobody else came. There was not yeah. a Rico Rush, a Mac Also Brooks, a Eric Johnson, a Pete Jackson. These are individuals that came. I remember the guy said, I have a you, question. no one ever asked us to be peaceful. Right. Well, Bob, I have a question. I always wanted to ask this. Do this. What made you decide to let us come up in that office? To do what? He said, what, what made you decide to let us come, come up in that office that <laughs> night? 
that first meeting. <laughs> and everyone, until we, you seen that we was okay. But what made you, you don't see that. <laughs> it's like, no, I be wondering, like, what did you think? Well, first of all, we searched you. We are spirit filled, but we ain't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Took a chance. They came in separate bands, and we know we had a meal. We had you set up because we know the kids fight when they're drinking together, not when they're eating. So we had a chicken dinner for them. <laughs> so, but it's because of just the blind love that I have for you and what I saw in you that you didn't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that goes to that question of vision, Bob. It's the ability to see things often that others don't. But it's not just enough to have vision because oftentimes vision fails us. It's the courage to take that's the right. action on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Gentlemen, I've, I've got to jump in Thank here. You. Uh, we, yeah. we went long, but it was worth going long because uh, we were able to hear your personal stories and we had a large panel here. We have some other large panels coming up. But Bob, what, what I'm hearing here, and, and to be honest and very clear, I grew up in Southeast Washington. Mm. Uh, let me make it clear. I grew up in Southeast, mm -hmm. Southeast. Southeast. Uh, <laughs> growing up in Anacostia uh -huh. and uh, Congress Heights. Uh -huh. And uh, to your point, gentlemen, the, the transformation comes by men like Bob who are bold enough, brave enough, loving enough to come in and love you right where you are. Mm -hmm in order to help you find God, in order to clean up the mess, and thereby when God cleans up your mess, you have one choice, and only one choice, and that's to become his messenger. That's right. To deliver a message of hope and transformation. So I want to thank every one of you for uh, all the great work that you've done, uh, and Bob, thank you for what uh, the Woodson Center has done, and all of you working together to transform uh, lives uh, in Benning Terrace and, and actually giving it a, a, a newness and a freshness. And the reason why it was so important for you to continue talking is because you were talking about exactly what's going on in Washington, D.C. Today, today and other cities throughout the mm -hmm. country, including the Attorney General having to send groups out to help these major cities. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say right now, uh, if anyone's watching and knows the Attorney General and knows the President of the United States, you need to come to the Woodson Center, you need to go to Benning Terrace, you need to reach out to people who are actively caring for people and for each other and police officers who are actively caring for each other in order to make a transformation and a renewing of our communities. Thank you gentlemen so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay, 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 stay. So that leads me to uh, my next uh, uh, information and that is at the top of the screen there's a donate button uh, what you've heard here are stories about transforming lives uh, some would call it transformative justice but it comes through a pattern that God gives us and Paul the Apostle talks about it in Romans where he says don't be conformed to the patterns of this world uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you saw examples of that right here Maybe not with the eloquence of a Paul the Apostle. Maybe not with the eloquence of the Bible. Maybe not with the eloquence of a, a Bob Whitson or a Dr. Martin Luther King. But certainly with the execution of making it right, making it good, making it stick. Because love is at the root of it. And love covers a multitude of sins. But love also engages us to talk to people that we uh, would often be fearful of. And I would also echo what Paul says, is that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind and self-control. So if you want to see this kind of program, these kinds of changes taking place in your neighborhood and do some good in your hood, or if you're living outside the hood and you think you can help do some good, put your corporate dollars to it, put your personal dollars to it, uh, hit that button for donate, and any gift is, it's, there's no gift too small, there's no gift too great, but make sure you do that and donate because it is very much appreciated. In addition to that, if you uh, can't hit the button at the top of the screen, I would urge you to go to WoodsonCenter.org and hit on the no donation button there as well and, and really uh, provide your, your help because you can see the transformation that's going on. So right now we want to come back to the uh, stage and we have uh, two guests who are joining us right now and Bob is going to engage in a conversation with these gentlemen. 
uh, Rick Wiederhold and Bill Chambra. And Bob, I will let you take it from there. Well, this is just a delight. These are old friends um, uh, <coughs> who, and, I, and the subject is responsible philanthropy. <coughs> and um, when I met Rick Wiederhold, he had just retired from the Allen Bradley Corporation. He was the treasurer of a, a billion dollar company riding all over the world in a private jet. Uh, uh, attending nice cocktail parties. <clears throat> and then he found himself uh, head of the Betty Brim Foundation. To, uh, uh, Bill Chamber was with the Allen Bradley Foundation uh, as a program officer. And they are examples of what I call creative uh, philanthropy. Uh, I remember, Rick, uh, that Andre Robinson, who you'll meet in the next panel, Latino Community Center negotiated uh, a violence-free zone in Milwaukee, and one of the gang members uh, decided to change, and in retaliation, his gang uh, shot at him and missed and killed his pregnant girlfriend. And he then decided to testify against them. And, but the gang then threatened his mother and their children. And so faced with that, I knew that we had to get them out of town, but the city had no uh, witness protection program. And I called you with my problem. And the first thing you said is not fill out my application that we have to take before the board's review committee. You said, Bob, expend the money from the center's coffers and I'll take care of it after the fact. And we were able to get this family sent to one of our other grassroots leaders in another city and when they were met, they were put up in a motel. Gary Wyatt, whom you met, had a relationship with Bed Bath & Beyond, and they shipped blankets and sheets. Shows you how the network operates. But Rick, it was your immediate response and when they, uh, that enabled us to do this, not only with that family, but two others. And, and we worked with the DA, and I believe today, as a consequence, the city of Milwaukee has a witness protection program. But, and, and, and Bill Chambra also um, did the same thing with some of the grassroots leaders that you met. And, and I'd like for you to just kind of talk about your experience uh, with these groups and why you did, you operated the way most foundations don't. Is this on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I um, <clears throat> was asked to run a foundation probably 30 years ago or so, and that's when I met Bob. And uh, quite frankly, didn't know what I was gonna be doing with this small foundation in Milwaukee. And Bob came to Milwaukee and did a What Works and Why conference, and it just inspired me. Um, and Bob has been an inspiration to me ever since. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the specific uh, witness protection program, the, our, our district attorney in Milwaukee County did not have any witness protection money, which is kind of unusual for a, uh, a county our size. And uh, we were able to, to support that. And I have to give a lot of credit to the board members that on my foundation that gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of flexibility to do that. And I also had another friend that had a, uh, several rooms in a nearby hotel. And when they did come to testify, we were able to put them up there so that uh, we did that secretly, obviously. So they couldn't be found and they were able to testify and, and uh, the perpetrator was convicted. So that's the, that's the story on, uh, on the witness protection program, but I, I wanna emphasize how uh, influential Bob was in, in directing me on how to find, found the foundation. He, he, when he came to Milwaukee, he brought people to this conference that I had never met before. And I lived in Milwaukee all my life. I was born and raised there. And these were folks that were doing really outstanding work, particularly in the inner city for people that needed help. And it was just such a blessing for me to meet them and get involved with them and, and uh, try to help wherever I could. My connection with the Bradley Foundation was that they were much larger than I was. And <clears throat> oftentimes when someone came to us for a major project, I would make a referral over there. And on the other hand, the Bradley Foundation, the person running it at the time, if he had something smaller, 
and something quick. He knew that my board gave me a lot of flexibility and we'd get that done quickly. And that's, uh, that was the witness protection program was one of those instances. Bill? Yeah, that's a, a really good example of uh, the kind of philanthropy, Bob, that you've inspired over the years. Um, it, it requires, I, I think people who run foundations have this notion that they really do know what's best for uh, the inner city. And uh, they, they hire the, the best experts from the local university to come in and study the problems of the neighborhood, the pathologies and so forth and so on. And you know the the conclusion is always well. We need to spend a lot more money on on uh, professional service providers to come in from the outside and you know parachute in their solutions. But you've always held, as long as I've known you, and that was that was <laughs> 40 years. Uh, you've always held that the wisdom to solve those problems uh, lies in the neighborhoods themselves, right? And as as Rick was saying. Um, you know, you can live in a city for years and years and not know that there are these centers of healing and, and strength in the inner city because they're overlooked, they're ignored uh, be, by the people who have the professional solutions, you know, the top-down solutions that bring in the experts. The real experts are the people that you've, uh, you've found for us and that you bring to us and that we, in turn, you know, have the privilege of, of supporting. So it, you know, it's, it seems simple in a way. It's, you know, just respond to the need that's immediately before you. You know, there's a $5,000 grant or a $10,000 grant that needs to be made. Uh, just do that. But beneath that is this profound shift in orientation that you've espoused all of your years. Uh, and if more funders understood that the wisdom lies in the neighborhood healers themselves, and you ask them what they need, and you help them solve their problems, uh, we'd be a lot better off, I think. And the interesting characteristic of those, most of those folks is that when I started the foundation, people said, well, you know, you sit in your office and you're, you get grant requests and you decide, you know, decide which one to give the, uh, the money to. And oftentimes, those are the folks that give you a quid pro quo. If you can give us X, we can do Y. What surprised me was the folks that we're talking about that I had never met in the 50 or 60 years that I was around Milwaukee before I met Bob, was that that wasn't their attitude at all. Their attitude was, we're committed to this. It's a ministry. And if you can help a little, that would be great. But if you can't, you know, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. It was not, give me this and I'll do that. If you don't give it to me, I won't do it. Just the opposite. It was that, that commitment that uh, really impressed me because I wasn't expecting it. What I found also with comment with you and, and, and Bill is your willingness to sit and listen and learn from untutored people. The biggest barrier that we have is not racism, it's classism. The assumption that untutored is unwise, and therefore the smart people are the ones who do it, or the ones that we should listen to, and that's what's captive right now. That's why we don't have a race problem, we have a grace problem. We have, and, and, and these witnesses that you saw and that you hear coming up from Milwaukee those are the real healing agents, and collectively they represent an immune system. That's why what the, the Woodson Center does is identify these individual healing agents. And together, if they, they can become an immune system, just like these fellows were talking about, how they transform the whole Bending Terrace community. Mm -hmm. Once their character changes, their characteristic is useful but because the kids used to fear them, now they respect them. But the main thing is they have control in a positive way. And I think the whole nation can be healed if we had people in positions like you at foundations could exhibit the kind of flexibility. And one funny note, I remember one of our, we brought a, a bunch of our guys from, um, 
uh, Hartford, because one of the things I do with all these young people, we took some of the Benning Terrace guys white water rafting in Alaska. We also took them to San Antonio, Texas. We took them to Hartford. The main thing is getting, and some of them had never even traveled uh, to the Potomac River at age 23, and it's just 20, mile, 20 uh, uh, minutes away. And so we tried to ride, race. So I remember Chen, uh, who was late coming to our conference from the hotel, and I think, uh, Rick, you gave him a lift to the hotel. He says the first time he's ever been in a car with a white man, he wasn't going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> and he told the conference, and we all cracked up, man. But they, they have a great sense of humor, man, yeah. I think. So. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you. I, you know, I'd love to have more time, but we've got, a, we've got so many other guests as well. But Rick Weirhold and Bill Schomburg, thank you for uh, your heart and your sensitivity and your ability to actively care for people right where they are. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for the, the great work that you've done in not only helping the Whitson Center and Bob Whitson, but helping yourselves as well. Because to give, it's better to give and you receive more. And, and I, I do believe that God is uh, blessing each and every one of you who have had the openness of heart to give and the presence of mind to understand why you're giving and to see that uh, come back, ex back exponentially. Gentlemen, thank you. Happy to be you here and to honor good. Bob and uh, everything he's done over the past 40 years. It's been unimaginable, right. but great. Ditto. Thank you. And, and just going to your point, uh, the, getting to know the people that Bob introduced us to yeah. was, was an, just an immeasurable reward in itself. You know, Cordelia Taylor, Deacon Bill Locke, uh, uh, Victor Lessie and Don Handy. Barnett, Leslie Handy. These are all folks that I, you know, we never would have met, but they were such a gift, and they really have enriched our lives. So thank you, Bob, for that, that great gift. All right, thanks. Isn't it amazing how when we reach outside of ourselves and outside of our environments, we get to meet people who, that we think have no common uh, commonality with us, but we find that once we get out of our comfort zones and get into different zip codes of people that we don't know, that we already have a preconceived notion of what it's, going, what it's going to be like. And then when you finally get down to the nub of it, you find out that there's that human element, that heart. Uh, and that's what Bob's been able to, to, to tackle. He's been able to tackle uh, all of those things that have stood in the way, the roadblocks, the impediments, the obstacles, the challenges of skin color. Uh, of, of zip code, of being marginalized, being an ostracized, being, but then turning it around so that people can optimize a moment to actually break bread together and find out, oh, if we do this together, you mean we can have some victory? Yes. Uh, and that is the one thing that we need to remember here in America and around the world. I, I want to move on now to the uh, 2000s, the early 2000s. We are now in the 21st century. And so we want to show you uh, some video highlights of what's been going on uh, with the Whitson Center at the turn of the century. Let's watch and learn. At the dawn of the 21st century, the Whitson Center had pioneered new ways to effectively support neighborhood transformation for the people who needed it most. The county, the county itself was not only, is not only a poverty stricken county, it's a rural county. It's located between Selma and Montgomery, has a rich civil rights history. Uh, and the county has a, uh, has, has a, a history of local people being involved and engaged with people like Mr. Wilson who came from the outside to help us find solutions together. The result of Mr. Wilson teaching me about economic development, at that particular time we were able to put together a comprehensive economic development plan for Lowndes County, which had not been done for a very long time prior to then. Uh, we also were able to enlighten other people about the issues that were happening there and a number of uh, politicians at that time came to visit as well as people from various corporations. We were able to put together the forerunner for my organization, the Alabama Center for Rural Enterprise, which was the part of the Alabama Rural Initiative. 
And that was the beginning of me stepping out and doing the work that I'm doing now. The Hands Across initiative that the Woodson Center launched in Washington, D.C. consisted of over 50 organizations. These organizations were in need of uh, capacity building and technical assistance uh, services. The Woodson Center understood that these organizations needed financial management, uh, they needed program evaluation, and they needed board development. It was more important not just to tell them what they needed to do, but to show them what they needed to do. And so, uh, wonderful videos about what's been happening here in the 21st century, and I'm going to make a, an audible as a moderator because we uh, want to show you a couple more selfies right now. So, production team, let's uh, show a couple of selfies that we did not show. We want to start with Anise, and we're also going to introduce you to Anise Holston, who has a wonderful selfie, as well as Darius Robinson. Hello, my name is Anise Hostin, and I am extremely grateful and thankful for the opportunity of participating and celebrating 40 years of excellence as we celebrate Mr. Bob Wilson and the Wilson Center. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Wilson over 20 years ago when I worked with a grassroots organization under the Violence Free Zone Initiative as a youth advisor. Serving youth and their families living in Ward 7 and 8 of the District of Columbia as well as Prince George's County, Maryland. Some of those resources and support look like mentoring, tutoring, advocacy, life skills building, athletics, but most importantly, family strengthening. How I know I had an impact on those families is because when they see me today, they are walking up to me, they are running up to me, they are yelling my name, they are embracing me, and they are thanking me for the work that I did with their families over 20 years ago. Mr. Wilson, you are a man of strength, courage, and wisdom, and I wish you 40 plus more years of excellence. Let me try to get this. I met Bob when I was 17 years old. At that time, it was the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprises. I was living in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., but God had a mission for me. Bob was able to get this 17-year-old kid to stop a war in the neighborhood where the police don't even go in. We were successfully able to stop the war, not just in D.C., but all around the world. If it wasn't for Bob, this video wouldn't even exist. That's what the Wilson Center did for me. Now I'm the owner operator of DMR Solutions, networking company, where we find and fix the situation. Thanks for all you do, Bob. Love you, big guy. <laughs> you feel good about that, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, he feels good about that. Uh, so uh, I, we're going to show one more selfie before we bring up our panel. And this selfie no, is so. it's from Jubal no, Garcia. Yeah. Uh, who has an incredible uh, testimony and a yeah. selfie, and it reinforces the highlights and the conversations that we need to be having about community affiliate networks, the leaders, and their impact. If we can show this next selfie right now. Robert L. Woodson. What can I say? Bob, you've been such a friend, uh, a father, a mentor, a brother, for so many years, first to my father and then to me. I'm so excited to celebrate this 40 year anniversary of the Woodson Center. There's so much I could say, but most importantly, I wanna say thank you and I love you. Thank you for being such a man of God, such an example, such a friend, such a brother to me in the hardest times of my life. You've done it for me and you've done it for millions. I can only hope that one day my legacy will be like yours, loving God and loving people. Congratulations, Bob, from San Antonio, Texas, the entire Garcia family, and all of us here at Outcry in the Barrio, we love you. I really wanted that before we came into this because uh, what Jubal, uh, and first of all, I love that name, Jubal. He's jubilant, and he, uh, he has a heart uh, for, and a hunger for, for God and for people. 
And you can't go wrong when you love God and love people, right, Bob? That's right. All right, so we're going to introduce your next guest, who, because they know something about the community affiliate networks that you've established. So allow me to introduce uh, again, Terrence Mathis joins us again. We're also joined by Alicia Manning, Don uh, Barnett, and Andre Robinson, Director of Violence Free Zone for both the Latino Community Center and the Milwaukee Christian Center. Welcome, Bob. Yeah, let me just say two things that stand out uh, when I look at my two leaders in the community um, that you hear all night. The common currency is trust and love. That's what makes the difference in these communities. And there are two examples of that that I always think about. And that is we had a press conference some years ago to celebrate the success of the Violence Free Zone in the schools and the Latino Community Center. And there was a 17-year-old old Hispanic woman who was an ex-gang leader. And she said, since I was in school, I've been to four funerals of my friends who were killed. She said, I'm not afraid of going to jail. I'm not afraid of dying. The only thing I'm afraid of is disappointing Andre. And that just moved the cameraman who was taking a picture to tears. And what moved me to tears is when I was sitting here with Don Barnett and Victor, and we were talking about a young man who they've been working with for a long time, and not all of them are successful. And this young man caught a charge and had a murder conviction. He was sentenced to life. And they said he was on suicide watch. And the psychiatrists and psychologists couldn't help him, and they had to put him on the phone with Don and, and to calm him down. And he said to Don, I just pray that you'll never give up on me. Here he is doing life, and yet mm. he can say to you, don't give up on me, which means that there was an expectation that you wouldn't. And that comes from a really deep place. And so uh, I want you to share with us what is it that you do? Well, first, Bob, I just want to say thank you for, for the honor of even being here uh, with you and celebrating with you. We've learned so much from you. Uh, Running Rebels Community Organization, founded by my husband, Victor, when he was 19, using basketball as a way to connect with young people to prevent them from joining the gangs at that time in 1980. So he was using mentoring before they called it mentoring. <laughs> he called it just being a big brother and being for, there for them when they needed it, made sure that they weren't just excellent men on the basketball court, but they were excellent men in the community and at home and at school. And, and you're right, it is showing up and not giving up and understanding that in this journey, young people are gonna make mistakes. And it's at those times that they need you the most. I, I just talked to Muhammad the other day. We have a Zoom call, because now they got really technical. Now we can do Zoom. And his caseworkers allow us to do this with him uh, as many times as he needs it to keep him uplifted and encouraged, because he has a long time. He has a long time to go. And he, not only do we encourage him, he encourages us. And in this work, it's, it's hard work. It is emotional and heavy. And I wanted to share a quick story with you because there was a time when you were bringing us all together. So all the leaders from throughout the, the country under the violence free zones and others that you worked with. And I don't know if you know that some of those were at crucial times when we were tired, we were tired. And to be around others and to be encouraged by them kept us going. So thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Andre, and then I want Alicia and Terrence to. First off, I want to say, Bob, uh, I thank you very much just for your leadership, your guidance, and most importantly, the fact that you seem to just have this this third eye, so to speak, where you just, um, I don't know, you see within people 
not just what they're doing, but that they can even take it further. You know, and, and that's a big deal, uh, just because when when we are Don and I, especially when we are looking for other people to mentor students, we gain that third eye. You know, and it's 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 something that I may not have gotten it from you directly, but it was honed by you. You know, so I, I appreciate you for that and, and all my love and I'm I'm grateful to, to have known you. I'm grateful that I've been a part of this, that you found me worthy to be a part of this, and thank you for the last 16 years. Um, uh, before I continue, I also wanna say that that young lady that you talked about, and he's talking about Vanessa Dawn, that young lady that you talked about, she's a, she has been an executive at PNC Bank. Wow. She has uh, worked with Rebels for a bit, you know, and she still comes back to violence free zone and she does financial literacy for our students you know so it's like um watching things go full circle she's not the only one um i have several former violence free zone students that have applied for violence free zone now that they are of age to actually work in the schools and where i wouldn't allow 23 and under so they had to get up there you know but um they're, they're finally able to do that and I am considering at least a couple of them for positions this upcoming school year so um, but when it comes down to why I do what I do um, I did an interview not too long ago where they were talking about um, this, uh, a different program called credible messengers and in the interview I told them when I grew up my credible messengers were gang bang gang bangers and drug dealers you know, um, we have a we have an opportunity now to take everything that we have learned, everything that we have experienced, all of the young people that we have guided and moved forward, and then bring them all into the group with us. And now we got some real credible messengers, you know, to to put out to this world as far as figuring out what's next for the young people. I would think I was talking to um, uh, Rick earlier, Rick Wiederhold earlier about uh, being a feeling like a dinosaur sometimes because, you know, the things that I grew up used to and even as a youth worker coming into, that's all changed now, you know. I mean, we have to adapt as the young people start to change, you know, and uh, youth advisors have to look at different ways to mentor young people that they have never, ever considered before, you know, and that, that means we got to be a bit more creative. We have to look at the issues that are happening in society, and then we have to talk amongst one another and say, okay, we don't know nothing about that, but what was similar to that, you know, and then use those nuggets to talk to the young people and let them help them. They will help us find that solution as far as what's next. When it comes down to the face of youth work now and what is necessary, what is needed now. What's needed is to make sure that every young person that you mentor, you teach them to be you and better. Teach them to do what you do for your community and more. Because once you do that, you are building this next generation of mentors because they are able to reach their peers a lot quicker than we can. Although we can do it, we got to build relationship. We got to establish rapport. We got to do all that stuff, but they already have it. So how about we give those young people the skills and the, the skill sets that we have so that they can walk into those same circles with the mindset of a mentor instead of the mindset of a peer. Um, and you, Bob, you know, I could talk about this all night. I know we got, you know, time constraints. So I will just, I appreciate you. thank you. Brother Alicia Manning with uh, the Bradley Foundation. The Bradley Foundation has been a supporter for the Woodson Center for well over 20 some plus years. And uh, we met Alicia when she came there and she's gone on retreats with us and she's been a part of the Woodson Center family. And uh, she's still an officer with the Bradley Foundation and the liaison with the communities. I wish she would uh, uh, reflect on uh, creative uh, funding and just what? Well, <clears throat> I'll add my thanks, Bob, first to the litany of thanks. Everyone has so much gratitude for you. And just as Andre said, um, I really appreciate that uh, in 1998, when we first met, 
you'd been working with the foundation already for a decade, and you saw something in me that I didn't know I had um, within myself, and you uh, invited me to Utah with Edward Harris, who was out up here earlier, and <laughs> Curtis and Terrence and, and Heather Humphreys, who was on video, um, and that was a life-transforming uh, trip for me. Um, and it was when I realized that this wasn't a job, it was a, it was a vocation, it was a charism. Um, so you've been not only a professional mentor to me, but you've been a, a, a personal mentor to me in my life, and I'm grateful for that. Um, in professional philanthropy, we're sort of um, asked to keep uh, appropriate bureaucratic distance from our subjects. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that is not the way I've ever approached this work because of Bill Shambra and because of, of you. And um, I think it was probably Rick Wiederhold who introduced us to running Rebels, to Victor Barnett, Don's husband, and Don. Uh, and we had been supporting them for a number of years before um, the time be be emerged to start the Violence Free Zone in Milwaukee. Um, I think it would be difficult, if you're not familiar with professional philanthropy, to, um, to underestimate how much money is spent in communities by people who start with a piece of paper and a strategic plan and have no idea who's going to implement it <laughs> uh, and cre you know, create a job description and a position uh, uh, for some scientific approach to solving a problem. Uh, and then they wonder why it doesn't work. <laughs> I think what we've learned through the give and take over the years from each other, um, um, what, what I've certainly learned from you and what the community learns from you and you learn from them, is if you establish that moral authority and character are the most important thing, That's right. the, the vehicle, you know, the, the organization, the, the, you know, the sort of accounting system, all of those things can follow that and should, but the most important thing are the characteristics. And they are not uh, uh, something sort of ethereal that are impossible to describe. There are specific characteristics that you describe in all of your works. Um, are you available at 3 a.m. to answer the phone? Someone said that on an earlier panel. I don't have office hours. You have to answer the phone. <laughs> How do you talk about the people in the community that you work with? Um, uh, when you are following a leader through an organization, how much personal particular information do they know about the people that they are serving? Do they, are there hugs? You can tell all of these things. They're discernible. They might not be quantifiable, but they are discernible. Um, you've taught me and by extension many other people how to identify those people. So it was, a, it was an easy sell uh, when we decided to launch the Violence Free Zone in Milwaukee because there was such a base of trust already that we didn't really have to have all those conversations and negotiations. We didn't have to put a strategic plan on paper. It was just go time at one point. So thank you. Thank you. And Terrence, you were there to see it all and in the middle of, of it. I did, but I want to also say that it is so refreshing <clears throat> to be among <clears throat> these, my, my friends, my, my family here, and to see that those Woodson principles that we all hold so dear, it took hold here. When, when Dre talked about this third eye and the ability to see and the adaptation of those principles and seeing that those principles are actually being carried out, it is so incredibly, so humbling. And Bob, I, 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 I'm hoping that, and I know that you are very proud because the goal here is that's always been the goal. We're celebrating a 40th anniversary, but we want to see an 80th anniversary. We want, to, we, 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 want to, we want this to continue. And the only way this is to continue is through the representation that we have here. And it is not just relegated to some of the community practitioner voices that you heard, but as you can see, those principles have also been adapted through in philanthropy as well. So that tells me that this is working, and thank you so much for that. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. I want to thank all of you, and uh, it's, it's delightful to hear you talk about um, uh, how you and your husband launched this uh, with Running Rebels. Uh, he was 19 years of age, didn't even know what mentoring was, but he knew that he was called to something great, and you're talking about philanthropy, and you, Andre, are talking about reaching out to 
uh, souls that thought they were lost, and yet because of the love that each and every one of you expressed, Terrence, you included, those souls have been found. And as a result of that, the main thing that people really want is freedom. They want love, they want freedom, they want peace. So I'm going to season this and sprinkle this, like you were saying, moral authority. I'm going to exercise some uh, wits and principles based on Paul the Apostle stating uh, in Galatians, for everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. So I want to thank you for doing that and exemplifying that and helping gang leaders and gang members and wayward souls understand that you know, if we continue to bite and ravage and devour each other, what does that leave us except to annihilate each other? So you had to sow some seeds of love and you've soiled, uh, you've actually put it on good soil and it's coming back. Even if they've lost their way, they're still coming back saying, I remember what you did for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is, since we were talking about philanthropy, this is another time to remind you that you can be philanthropic Thanks. as well and you can be charitable, but more importantly, you can be loving. And, and you can express that love by going to that donate button that you see at the top of the screen, or you can uh, log on to uh, the website for the Woodson Center, woodsoncenter.org, and, and hit the donate button. And remember, as I've stated before, no gift is too small and certainly no gift is too great. Uh, give for, uh, from what your heart tells you, what your spirit tells you, and understand that you are adding to uh, the transformation of communities that are in need of uh, uh, the Woodson Center as well as in need of the organizations that work locally and those local heroes and sheroes that are always stepping up to do something positive, something bold, and something brilliant and more importantly, showing the world that they actively care for people right where they are. So uh, Bob's going to uh, bring our next guest on, and he'll talk to him. His name is Paul Grodel. And you heard me talking about uh, what Paul the Apostle was about, you know, love each other as God would love you. And uh, this gentleman knows something about that because he knows about redemption, uh, and he knows that redemption can occur in all communities. Paul, by the way, is with uh, Beyond the Walls Church in Ohio. Bob, I'll let you take it from here. Well, in 2012, when Paul Ryan was uh, in the last throes of losing the vice presidency in the election, he called me and asked me could he uh, gather some grassroots leaders together in the state of Ohio. So I called Bishop Marva Mitchell who is an old time friend and say, Marva, and, uh, can you help me uh, identify some people? And the first person she connected me with was Paul Gradell and a few others. And I called Willie Peterson and also Gary Wyatt to join me at the last minute. And so um, Paul had security at the time and we had to submit the names of the invitees. So they sent to the White House and I got this Harry call from uh, one of Paul's staff. He says, Bob, uh, five of these guys have criminal records. I said, I thought all of them had criminal records. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. But so he said, well, if Paul trusts them. So Paul said, if Bob trusts them, I trust them. So they were lined up, you know, to come in. It was a big gathering, but Paul was going to have a small group of us in the private room. So there was this guy in line. They said, Bob, there's some guy in line, man. He's driving a Harley. <laughs> and he says, he's one of your people. I said, so I went out. I said, oh, that's Paul. He is one of our people. <laughs> and so Paul came in, and we sat around, and Secret Service was uptight. Right, Paul? They were eyeballing me, really. They were eyeballing <laughs> yeah. everybody. And then midway through the presentations, um, at the end of the meeting, Paul Gradell ask if he could pray for Paul Ryan. He got up and put his hands on him and all of us stood around and I saw the Secret Service weeping. Hmm. They were suspicious and uptight but when they saw the grace of God in action in that room put in their hands and it changed Paul Ryan because when he heard the confessions coming from the group gathered it was reflected in his autobiography. He talked about the trouble he had with his father, but I don't think he would have shared that personal 
testimony wow. if he was not in the presence of people who are transparent. So Paul um, has a very unique ministry that he has become a part of our family. So share something about your own uh, testimony and also how you've used that uh, testimony in your ministry. Uh, I got addicted to pain pills in the uh, in 80s and then into the 90s I, I got into heroin use and that was back when uh, heroin use wasn't popular like it is now it was basically crack cocaine um, so my son was born in 1990 um, in February about June I, I just got done shooting some dope I walked into his bedroom and I saw this amazing little baby in a crib same name as mine, only Paul Grodel III. And with all my heart, I wanted to be the best father I could be. But I knew what I was. I was a junkie. I, 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 was, I was broken. And so that prompted me to go into a rehab because I tried to kick on myself a couple times. I got so sick. And the amazing thing is my wife, who we've been married 38 years, she stood beside me. And... Um, so I went into a rehab, come out 30 days later. I didn't go back to heroin, but I'm chewing pills and snorting cocaine. And I just, I struggled for years. And then I gave my life to Christ in 1994. Got set free immediately. But one thing Jesus always put in my heart, he said, never forget where I found you. So I eventually became a children's pastor. I know I look like a children's pastor. You would trust the kids to me, right? Um, but uh, I went into full-time ministry, and about 2008, God started putting on our hearts, my wife and mine, to start an inner-city church, um, and basically a church for people that would never come to church. And so God gave my wife the name of the church Beyond the Walls. So we actually started going out into the neighborhood, the neighborhood that we have the church in now is in South Elyria. Uh, the poverty rate for the one, one mile square area around the church is over 54%. Um, drug addiction, the opiate epidemic has been just uh, killing people left and right. And in 15 and 16 and 17, I would do probably average of uh, six funerals a month. And most of the funerals were, were people 30 and under. Uh, many times the parents wouldn't have uh, money to pay for it, so we would gather the money together, have the services in the church. Um, but we eventually became this church um, that was known as that church. <laughs> and uh, because I am a grace preacher, uh, we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ so that no one can boast. Um, so it's grace, grace, grace. Romans 7, 4 says we're dead to the law so we could be married to Christ. And so, again, it's about grace. Grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but Jesus, when he looked out on the crowds, even though he was God, he saw, he could have looked at all the people's sins, but he chose to look at with compassion and so people in the area know they can come to church as they are and if they got alcohol on their breath if they're struggling with drug addiction god forbid they got tattoos on their arms or piercings we'll still let them in um, because everybody deserves a second third fourth fifth there is a life no life is, is worth giving up on as far as I'm concerned. God wouldn't have that. And I wouldn't be here today if God would have gave up on me. And in 2012, when I met this man, um, I was very leery of anything that came out of Washington. <laughs> in fact, when he called me and asked if I would meet with Paul Ryan, I didn't even know who Paul Ryan was. <laughs> we were coming out of doing a service in the uh, uh, Wilkes Villa housing uh, area in Illyria and as he asked me I, I whispered to my wife is Paul Ryan is he the dude running with Mitt Romney I, I, I'm not sure and she goes I don't know and I said well I'll meet with them anyways so through that I met Bob and one thing that struck me about Bob was and especially now in this in this country everybody's b blaming everybody um, 
And people are trying to divide people on color and other things. And Bob is trying to bring people together. Jesus said um, the peacemakers will be called sons of God. So it, we shouldn't be people that blame others. We should be people that come together because we love people no matter where they're at because every life is valuable. And I saw a man that was all about that. And he's always helped us. I couldn't believe the one time I called you uh, when we bought the building and the city kicked us out um, for a fire code violation. And I said, Bob, would you come to Elyria? He said, when do you want me to come? I was like, I'm calling this guy in Washington. And he's saying, when do you want me to come? I says, as soon as you can. He says, I'll be on a flight tomorrow. It blew my mind because here's a guy that, that is full of knowledge, out of Washington, runs with the big guys, um, but yet was willing to come to a little town called Elyria because there was a church there that wanted to help alcoholics, homeless, addicts, and he was all about it. He ended up raising, helping to raise some money so we could get back in the church, and um, I've been in love with him ever since. It's, it's a God-ordained appointment, and I thank you, Bob, because you give me inspiration. Well, I thank you. And, to never uh, quit. It's, it's just an example of, um, uh, of the kind of ministries that are needed, and uh, we, we, we just believe in the fellowship, man. But I want to thank you for sharing that with me. And, well, uh, and thank also. you for allowing us to be part of this amazing organization. We've, we've gotten to know Jubal down in San Antonio, and our church is so much similar. We've got people um, that go out on the streets weekly, go under bridges, go into hotels, bringing people out of addiction, and it's the people that were in addiction a year ago. It's because though you, you can never understand what it's like to be an addict unless you are an addict or were an addict. Yeah. I'm not an addict anymore. I'm not a, I don't claim to be an addict. The Bible says I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away and the new has come, and that's what we teach people. As a man or a woman thinks, so she will live. And we've seen so much victory in that. And meeting people right where they at, just like Jesus did. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Amen. All right. I want to thank you and, of course, Bob. And uh, what an incredible story, Paul. Thank you so much for that. And uh, to all the people uh, at Beyond the Walls Church, uh, make sure you check out this uh, wonderful brother, Paul Grudel, who uh, has learned something uh, personal about transformation through the renewing of his mind, and uh, he's becoming a messenger of faith, hope, and love. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. All right. Okay. And uh, at this point, we want to go to another video, but as we prepare to show you the video, I want to remind you about the importance of donating. Uh, hit that donation button at the top of the screen or go to woodsoncenter.org and hit the donation uh, because you can see through all of these different programs and all the different people that we're hearing from that this really is where the rubber meets the road and this is uh, you know you heard Bob you heard Paul talk about how how Bob responded immediately responsiveness that's what love is and and he does it from the goodness of his heart but it also requires uh, some fundamental things like you know, people do need funding for this wonderful organization. So we go now to chapter five, Bob, uh, another video highlight of you, which is really um, deeply moving, and it talks about the 21st century uh, beyond what uh, we've seen thus far since the 1960s through the 70s and the uh, 80s and the 90s and the initial 2000s. Now we're talking about the, the 21st century and the launch of 1776 Unites and voices of Black Mothers United. Let's watch and learn. In the next decade, the Woodson Center adapted again to meet the challenges facing the nation's most vulnerable communities, placing it in the crosshairs of controversy. Hurricane Harvey ravaged the Houston area late August of 2017. 
So the, the Woodson Center and Texas Public Policy Foundation, we partnered together to bring relief to the, the community of Houston. Some of these people have lost everything. So we, we worked with them and over the, a few week period, um, we were able to get um, a, a hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of supplies out to folks um, and, and help thousands of people. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. It's not something typical in the policy world that we get to do and actually like work with people on the, on the street level, which is great. Seventeen seventy six Unites was an effort undertaken by the Woodson Center to respond to the sixteen nineteen project by the New York Times that defined America as incurably racist. But we published a series of essays by scholars and activists to refute their notions that America is racist by providing inspirational and aspirational accurate accounts of how blacks achieved against the odds even under slavery and discrimination. The Voices of Black Mothers United is an initiative of the Woodson Center. Uh, we are mothers who've lost children to violence in our communities and we needed a voice. And Mr. Woodson of the Woodson Center has given us that voice to go out and advocate, to help other mothers heal, to help communities heal, to do community intervention, to bring about safer communities and, and do activities to bring law enforcement together with the community and promoting positive policing. Center has been a catalyst for upward mobility and neighborhood enterprise for 40 years, but it is just getting started. There is so much more to come. The Woodson Center has been at the forefront of facing, helping the country face many challenges over this four decades. We have mobilized grassroots leaders. We've pushed against those who would denigrate our country, those who would defame our values. We've brought together low-income people, upper-income folks, black, white, brown, red. We all came together united in support of this nation's values, and we hope you will continue to support us and come join us in our journey into the future. wonderful video and I think Bob said it best in that video come join us for our journey into the future and I would just tell you that uh, God's plan for the future is not for disaster but for a future and a hope uh, and uh, I want to go now to a selfie and we're continuing now with our selfie and we want to hear from this particular selfie from Glenn Lowry Hi. this is Glenn Lowry professor of economics at Brown University and I'm just so uh, grateful for the opportunity to offer a tribute uh, to Robert Woodson, uh, my dear friend for 40 years nearly, uh, and uh, to honor the work that uh, he is doing uh, at the Woodson Center, formerly the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Um, I first met, met Bob back in the 80s. Um, he is responsible for me setting foot inside of the White House in 1985, I believe it was, to meet with President Reagan. For me, meeting and getting to know Congressman and Secretary Jack Kemp uh, for the great work being done through the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise on uh, tenant rights and ownership of their public housing units on uh, self-help of African Americans and others uh, fighting poverty on the ground in the neighborhoods and so forth. Uh, and here we are four decades down the line, uh, Bob continuing with energy and vision to lead this grassroots initiative. Uh, the Woodson Center being a focus of uh, 
creative, dynamic thinking on the cutting edge of African American and American cultural politics, rising to the occasion of giving voice to a different perspective than the 1619 Project through the 1776 Unites Initiative, um, organizing and encouraging mothers who have survived the loss of their children to gun violence and the cities of this country to speak up and speak out in a tone different from the radical and the professional race grievance of people whom Bob is so effective in criticizing. <laughs> Voices of Black Mothers United. So I'm, I'm just proud to have an affiliation with this activity and grateful for the contribution that Robert Woodson through the Woodson Center has made and is making to American civic life and to African American dignity. Thank you very much. Glenn Lowry, thank you very much. And now Bob is joined by uh, more guests who know him well, Ian Rowe, Beth Feely, and Stephanie Deutsch. And Bob, uh, you have a lot of discussions here. Yeah, when uh, 1619 it published that uh, awful uh, series of uh, essays in the New York Times and it, it took off. Um, I was working with Beth Feely on the phone, a frustrated housewife in suburban uh, Chicago, was concerned about critical race theory, dominating and we developed a relationship and she really helped me think this through. We wanted to respond but we didn't want to offer a counter debate. Uh, since they used the black community as the symbol of uh, hostility toward the country, we thought that the leadership should also be black. And so that's why I pulled together a primarily black scholars and, and activists uh, to respond. But we, we wanted to offer, again, not a debate, but an inspirational, aspirational alternative narrative. And so we wanted to just probe. Uh, so I want the, uh, my panelists to the essayists and, and leaders to talk. Stephanie Deutsch uh, d did one of the most uh, uh, moving essays, uh, and I'll let her introduce herself. And then I'll ask uh, 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 Ian and then Beth to uh, comment on it. Well, thank you, Bob. Gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm touched and, and uh, flattered to hear you say that. I was so excited when you called and asked me to join 1776 because I knew about you, of course. You had actually called me when my book came out and complimented me on it, and I was so grateful for that. Um, but it also, writing the essay, gave me a chance to reflect on what a profound experience it had been for me to write my book about Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the building of schools for the segregated South, which we're going to talk about a little bit, but to realize how ignorant I was of black history and what a profound experience it was for me to really think about the history I was learning in the context of what was happening all around right now. And uh, so it was, it was such a such a realization for me that in some ways things had been so much worse than I had understood and in some ways they had been so much better. And it was tremendously encouraging to have the opportunity to think about it in that way and uh, it's also encouraging to, to find that in the wake of 1619, 1776, one of the things that's come out of it is a general acknowledgement. Studying our history is a good thing. Studying mm -hmm. our history, knowing our history, learning our history, that's a good thing. And there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it to learn. The curriculum that 1776 has created is just wonderful. I just spent some time this afternoon looking at it. And it's so well done. There's so many lessons that one doesn't know. And there's so much to be proud of for all of us. Mm -hmm. Ian? Uh, thank you, Bob, and it's, it's uh, such an incredible honor to be here with you tonight, and I've really cherished really the last two years getting to know you in particular and just being honored to be part of this larger movement that you've helped to create. You know, I come to this uh, from the perspective of a practitioner, 
you know, someone for, for whom, you know, the last 10 years I ran a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. You know, more than 2,000 students, primarily low-income um, black and Hispanic uh, students, and, and more than um, 5,000 families on the wait list uh, to get into our schools. And our, you know, this rising generation, they just want a shot. They just want a shot at the American dream. And their parents, they chose our schools because they thought we would have high expectations, that we would not be focused on a victimhood narrative or ever, all the things that they cannot do in our society, but the things that they can do. And that to learn that they live in a good, if not great country, that a, can allow these opportunities and that their founding principles around faith and family and hard work and free enterprise and entrepreneurship, these things that are within their capacity to take control of their own lives. And it was against that backdrop that I first met you in the 1619 Project, and it was telling a very different story. It was saying that the country wasn't even founded in 1776, it was founded in 1619. It was saying that the country was founded as a slaveocracy and not a democracy. It was saying that anti-black racism runs in the very DNA of the country. Like DNA is a permanent characteristic. These were the things that this uh, curriculum was saying, and, and that's just false. And rather than just rail against that, you said, you know what, we have to have a compelling alternative. And that's really powerful. Because it's not important, it's, 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 it's important to say no to something, but it's more important to have something to say yes to. And you, you really crafted that, and it was just an inspiring vision. And you know, it's, it's not for nothing that across the country, according to the nation's report card, only 15% of all kids in our country have even a basic understanding of all of American history. So you uh, inspired much of us to say, how can we tell a complete story? Not just a cherry-picked version of American history where you just look at the most atrocious elements of the past and say, that's the story of the United States. Have the courage and confidence to help to tell the whole story of the United States, the stories of oppression and the stories of resilience and triumph over adversity. And that's what the 1776 Unites curriculum, even just the, the snippet of it that we've created, the, the goal is to create a free K to 12 curriculum. Right now it's just grades nine through 12. Uh, more than 15,000 downloads have already occurred mm. by teachers in all 50 states and in traditional public schools, charter schools, private schools, home schools, uh, prison ministries, um, anywhere where character formation is happening. And we can talk more about the content, but that's what the Woodson Center does. It's not just about railing against the problems, it's about creating solutions that we can put in the hands of people who are trying to solve problems in their own communities. Good. And Beth, you're role in this conspiracy of ours. <laughs> I, I remember that conversation that we first had. I think I asked you to come speak at my kids' high school because I saw these uh, strains of racial grievance and in the curricular choices they were making and it was of grave concern and I saw it was very one-sided, very agenda-driven and completely absent were people like you and the work of the Woodson Center. And I thought, this, in order to be educational, we need to hear from people like you. And so thus began um, some emails and then conversations. And then, yes, when the 1619 Project came upon us, uh, I believe you said, we need to do something. So it was my humble honor to assist you in making your vision come true, putting some of my project management and writing skills to, to use and, um, and assembling this, this wonderful group that is an extension, um, in a way, of the work that you've done. And it's just, um, it's an honor to be here uh, to help and, and to continue to make, you know, the stories come alive that I had heard you tell now that they're in lessons is just, um, it, it's just, it's benefiting students across the country, our nation as a whole. And so um, we're just, we're all blessed to be a part of it. What I guess I like most about it is that we stayed clear to politics it's not ideolo ideologically driven. We have people from different points of view. Uh, we have some Democrats on there. We have people who would be center left. 
Um, but people who are united in principle that supports this nation. And I think in your book in particular, uh, Rosenwald is, is, is a real hero with Booker T. Washington, and, uh, and we were able to, uh, we'll be working together in a project to restore some of those schools because, and I think this is a rare opportunity for people, we need something unite, to unite us around. And I think the restoration of some of the Rosenwald schools is an opportunity for the young and old to come together, black, white. Uh, there are very few instances when, when people on, on, on one side is talking about taking statues down, we need to be talking about supporting uh, statues and symbols that, that speak to unity and, and, and the solid values of, uh, of American democracy. And so I think that's an, I, I'm excited to contrast people who are taking down statues to us uh, restoring symbols. You know, that's so true, uh, Bob. And what could be a greater symbol of America than a schoolhouse? Because so many people came to this country wanting the freedom to, among other things, get their children educated. And um, I'm thinking of a Rosenwald school that I visited uh, on the northern neck of Virginia that had not been restored. And, and much of the, the st stuff that had been in it when it was a schoolhouse was still there. And there was a box. And I reached into the box. And it was a book, a civics textbook from 1920. And so I opened the civics textbook from 1920. And on the first page, it said, the purpose of the public school, the American public school, is to create good citizens. Mm. And I thought that was such a perfect description of what the Rosenwald schools did, um, bringing people together from communities, creating the schools, um, donating the land, housing the teachers in their homes if the teachers came from far away. And now the same thing is happening again as people in those communities work to restore those buildings so that they can remember with pride what, what, what they were able to do for their communities. What, what I find so amazing about the, the Woodson Center 1776 Unites curriculum is that there's this look back component that includes stories about the Rosenwald schools, which I'm always stunned many educators don't know about these incredible story of resiliency uh, to build nearly 5,000 schools um, in the South, specifically for black children, but also stories about Biddy Mason, you know, people who were born a slave, died a millionaire, Elijah McCoy, inventors, just amazing stories. So the whole, the whole look back component is an opportunity for more young people of all races to have a more complete understanding of the African American experience in the United States. But there's also a look forward component. And that's what's really empowering for me. It's what are the tools, what are the principles? I mean, one of the lessons is actually focused on the Woodson principles. Courage, resiliency. How do young people start to adopt and adapt these behaviors in their own lives so that they can lead a self-determined life? That they can overcome the victimhood narrative. So for those of you who are interested in bringing an incredible curricula into your schools, into your homes, 1776unites.com, it's free and you'd be joining 15,000 15, other people who've already <laughs> downloaded uh, these great lessons about looking backward to understand our history and also looking forward about how you can control your own life and become an agent of your own uplift. Well, we have a powerful animation coming too. And then there's that. It's powerful animation. So we're going to be able to, uh, to children. One of the uh, most popular books in the socialism section of, of um, uh, Amazon is Communism for Kids. When, Stephanie, when you said that uh, that book said the purpose of school is to create good citizens, I think now you're seeing a trend that the schools are seeing themselves as their, their mission is to create the next right. generation of activists. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that plays into that book being popular. And just to add onto the curriculum, we specifically chose lesser known stories. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a few figures that are very well known and we really felt like there was a really um, unplumbed depth of, of content in these stories that the, con the consistent reaction is, why have I never heard of this? Why, and um, so we think you'll find that if you, if you check the curriculum out.
I want to thank all of you uh, for coming up here to share your insights about uh, the Whitson Center and your relationship to Bob Whitson. Uh, Ian Rowe, Beth Feely, and Stephanie Deutsch, thank you all so very much. And now, again, I would like to <laughs> encourage each and every one of you to uh, consider funding uh, the Whitson Center. You can go thank to you. the top of the screen there where you see donate and see that donate button, click it. Or you can go to the Whitson Center uh, website, WhitsonCenter.org, uh, and find the donation <laughs> column there and click on that. In the interim, we have another selfie from a man that I've known for uh, a short time, but feel like I've known him for many years. He is John Ponder. Hi, I'm John Ponder, founder and CEO of Hope for Prisoners. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to briefly share my sincere and heartfelt gratitude for my dear friend Bob Woodson and the Woodson Center. Congratulations on the 40 year anniversary of a legendary and world changing organization that has not only impacted my organization in so many positive ways, but has impacted me personally. Bob, your dedication and determination to stand on the principles of truth and justice has caused a ripple effect that has touched a countless number of people. I often reflect on the many grassroots leaders and organizations like Hope for Prisoners that has been supported and lifted up by the work of the Woodson Center. Bob, if you take notice of the amount of loved ones and supporters that are here today, you will realize that the seeds that you have planted over 40 years have resulted in such an amazing harvest. Your work has altered the course of so many lives, and I know that one day you will have the honor of hearing those words, well done, good and faithful servant. May God continue to bless you. Miss Ellen, your family, and all the wonderful <laughs> staff at the Woodson Center. Here's to the next 40 years of continued success and legacy. God bless you. John Ponder, thank you for that. And John Ponder is doing some ex excellent work uh, throughout the nation with Hope for Prisoners, but he's also uh, a proud supporter, as you can see, of the Woodson Center and works extensively with uh, Bob uh, on so many uh, occasions. And right now, I want to introduce uh, Wow, these, these ladies really are stunning. Uh, their story, uh, I'm gonna be quiet and let them tell their story along with Bob. Uh, let me introduce you to the voices of Black Mothers United and the importance of funding their work that the Woodson Center has been doing. Uh, let me introduce to you Sylvia Bennett Stone, Beverly Smith Brown, Danita Royal, and Sister Shirley Muhammad. I'm Thank just uh, delighted. Uh, Sylvia's been around us for quite a number of years, doing a training for us and training for us. Uh, and, uh, but one of the reasons that we wanted to turn to her is because everybody talks about you, but no one talks to you or asks you to talk for yourself. They are telling you uh, about police and whatnot. And so we were just delighted that uh, we should let uh, mothers of lost children speak for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Woodson. Um, Voices of Black Mothers United was born out of pain of mothers who's lost children to community violence. And I'd like to briefly share with you all um, how this came about on a phone call with the Mr. Woodson and community um, CAN member, as a community CAN member, and I shared why I've been gone away from the community for so long. And I shared my frustration of losing my daughter to violence and what that did to me, but yet what the community is doing, or not doing, rather, and Mr. Woodson said, you know, I, I think you all need a voice because did no one want to hear from us? They would tell the mothers, go away, pack away your pain along with your child's clothing and belongings. And that's supposed to be it. And it's not. But Mr. Woodson saw the vision because there's so many of us that exist. And there's, oh my God, I mean, 
to now have a voice and have a platform that we can not only tell our story, but this platform brings about solutions to help save others' lives. Mm -hmm. That's what we are about. We're about bringing forth solutions to, so to have safer communities in our lives, in our communities. Mr. Muhammad. Thank you, um, Mr. Whitson, for having me here and the Whitson staff. And um, I'm a proud member of the uh, Voices of Black Mothers United. I have been with the uh, Whitson Center for now 16 years total. Uh, started out with the uh, financial literacy training and I trained over 105 people in my city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And some of them are now still with me after all this time. And um, one day on a Friday, I was at a CAM meeting, Zoom, and I heard Mr. Woodson talking about uh, we need to address the black-on-black uh, -black violence in our communities. And at that time, I had just recently lost um, my grandson to uh, a homicide right in front of the Nation of Islam's mosque on a Friday. He was assassinated. And I was devastated that this would happen in front of a mosque. Um, I felt ashamed, I felt guilt, because he was a striving young man who was trying to change his whole life around. And, I, and nobody talked about it. Um, but we had uh, young black men basically getting uh, shot by the police, and they would just rally up and run downtown and protest, stop the traffic, but when there's a youth in our community who uh, is assassinated, who's murdered, no one says anything. It's just like they don't say anything, and so there's the isolation, uh, where's the support, no one says anything. So I'm happy to be with uh, Voices of Black Mothers United because we talk to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Woodson. Thank um, everyone at the Woodson Center. My name is Beverly Smith Brown, and I am a proud member of the Voices of Black Mothers United, um, state lead for DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, in 2017, I'm a native Washingtonian. I've been in Southeast DC my whole life, 40 something years. <laughs> and um, 2016, 2017, I met Mr. Tyrone Parker at the Alliance of Concerned Men and was uh, responding to trauma in um, Southeast in the zip code of 232. So I'll be on crime scenes looking for the victim to provide them with the resources that was affordable. Um, in October 2018, I responded to a crime scene that was my nephew, mm -hmm. um, two blocks from my sister's home, my sister's youngest son. Um, two weeks later, my sister, other son, Javon Smith, was murdered, mm -hmm. separate situation. Um, my sister lost both of her sons to gun violence in 2018. Devastating. Mama Safe Haven, we were already working in a community with families um, alongside with the Alliance of Concerned Men and other organizations. Partnership is key. To receive um, partnership with the Woodson Center means a lot as it relates to the groundwork that was already laid um, for those who came before us as it relates to giving us a voice. Um, to give the moms a voice, I feel, if not now, when? Thank you, Mr. Woodson. Um, I'm not a grieving mother. I get calls from grieving mothers. It's too many grieving mothers. We work with concerned mothers because we don't want them to be added to the list. To work close with the police, we're doing that, working with MPD. We're in, um, they have beat the streets, so we're in the communities. Um, and our goal is really to mobilize moms and to let them know that they are not alone and that we are gonna take our streets back one yeah. minute at a time. That's right. And to have the platform that the Wilson Center is providing for us is exciting. It's exciting for the, the cries at night to be heard and not just about police brutality, but the brutality of systemic issues that have been going on in our community way before I was born. So if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Donnie the Royal. Um, I've been a CAN member for about five years now. And when I was a member and 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 learning a lot about the <laughs> doing an organization and ministry, I never thought that uh, I'd be with Voices Black Mothers Unite. And I always wanted our voice, voice to be heard. And so when Mr. Woodson, thank you, thank you for hearing our voice, I always spoke of that our voice is not being heard enough. So I was so excited when I heard they come from you to hear our voice and to understand our pain. So I could say so much about you, Mr. Wilson. I am so glad that you hear our voice and that you understand our pain and that you being a voice for us. I could say so much, but I thank you. I thank you for helping us with this organization with Black Mother's Voice, that we will be heard. And I just thank you because our voice will be heard. <laughs> and I could say so much. I just want to leave it at that. I just thank you. I really do. Well, I thank you. Well, thank you for allowing us in your life uh, because we need to be a blessing to one another. And uh, not only do these mothers comfort one another, but they also cooperate with the police. They are a voice to speak. When everybody else is talking about defunding the police, they're not saying defund the police. They took out a full page ad we did, say we support the police and they've had conferences with the police. And, and that's why it's important for them to speak for themselves. I'm tired of people who have live in safe communities themselves and have personal security and then say they want to cut the police for poor folks. They don't, they're not willing to live by the, the advocacy, the things they're advocating for. When you talk about, we were the first ones to say, we support the police. We do not support defunding of police. And now the tone is turned around to where they understand why we need police in our communities. Crime has risen to a, a, a high number. Chicago, Atlanta, Birmingham, Indianapolis, and the murders are beginning to be our babies. Yeah. Yes. So this need to stop, and we're the ones to stop it. We're the ones who know we we've, we've gone through this. So therefore, we know exactly what it's going to take to bring about those changes. Yeah. We know exactly the solutions that need to come forth. Someone asked me last week about the um, meeting our President Biden had at the White House. He brought in the police chiefs. He brought in the mayors from all over. And their question to me was, now do you think we can get anything done? And I said, no, because they're talking at each other. And the main people that need to be at that table, Mr. Whitson, we're not there. No. no one is asking us, what do we think? But we are on the grounds every day having to react to these murders. So do you not think that we have a contribution? Absolutely. Invite us to the table, and you can see some solutions that would come forth. Yes, thank you. I, I, I want to thank all of you, and Sylvia, I especially want to thank you for appearing on my show not long ago. Thank you for having To me. talk about uh, this incredible organization, Voices of Black Mothers United, and, and certainly uh, the challenge that uh, the media has, as well as the government, uh, and the church for that matter, is to hear your voices, respond to your voices, and as uh, we've seen through the Woodson Principles, based on the biblical principles and the teachings of Jesus Christ, is to reach out and not only 
touch where you are, but develop relationships with where you are and to respect who you are and to glean from not only your pain, but to help you change that pain into power. So I want to thank you again, Sylvia Bennett-Stone, Beverly Smith-Brown, Donita Royo, and Sister Shirley Muhammad. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I leave, we have something that we would like to. Oh, this is unexpected. Just think, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Sorry. But we will not be long. We just want to show oh. our appreciation to Mr. Woodson. Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, look at it that. It is from the Voices of Black Mothers United. Bob, hold that up, And please. it says, mm -hmm. acknowledged by the people, but purposed by God. And wow. we thank you for giving us a voice, Mr. Woodson. Oh, thank you so much. We love you. Thank you so much. Say that again. Acknowledge. Acknowledged by the people, but purposed by by God. Amen. That says it all. It thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank thank you. You. I'll put this down here. Bob, that's yours. I don't want to. I know. I don't want to take it because. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Just put it there. Thank you. So right now we will hear from uh, someone who was going to be here today, and she will explain why she isn't here. But I've had the pleasure of interviewing her in the past. Bob, of course, had the pleasure of knowing her. And, and that is, uh, I call her the boss. She is Kathy Hughes. And without further introduction, here's a video now from Kathy Hughes before we get into our next segment, which she is a part of. Hi, I'm Kathy Hughes, the founder and chairperson of Urban One Incorporated. I was originally scheduled to be there with you tonight as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Woodson Center. However, I've been coughing and sneezing for three days now and can't be tested until tomorrow. So I thought in the best interest of everyone in attendance this evening that I send a message instead. Mr. Bob Woodson, I cannot put into words how you have impacted and changed my life. You taught me that a political party does not determine a person's commitment to their people. You taught me that regardless of obstacles and challenges, that if you have a mission that you feel that God called you to do, then nothing can stop you. There is no weapon formed against you that can ever succeed. I thank you, Bob Woodson, for teaching me the lesson of nonpartisan politics, because it's not the party that you believe or that you belong to. It's not the religion that you believe in. It's who you are. But most importantly, it's about what you do. I thank you for your dedication to affordable housing. I thank you to your support of education in particular lead to the Piney Woods Country Life School in Piney Woods, Mississippi, where you have sent students, but most importantly, during the midst, in the middle of the pandemic, you joined with me in a major fundraiser that directly impacted the future of Piney Woods School, already 113 years old, and because of your involvement and your support, we're good for another 113 years. Bob Woodson, it just almost brings me to tears to adequately thank you and express the impact that you have had on black America, how you have changed the minds of powerful white Americans about their commitment and what their dedication should be to dismantling institutional racism. Bob Woodson, happy anniversary, and I'm praying to God right now that you get 40 times 40 more years for the Woodson Center <laughs> to thrive. God bless. And Kathy Hughes, God bless you, and we are praying for you that you feel better as well. We're sorry that you couldn't be here, but we're delighted uh, for your message to Bob Woodson and, of course, the great work that you've done as well with the Piney Woods uh, School and the great work that you've done throughout this country for black and white America and all America. Let me just make that crystal clear. Uh, Bob, you know, this is, uh, this is really special to me because the, what she was referring to was this wonderful occasion uh, that you and I were also part of. We were the uh, co-host of that, and that's the Piney Wood School. And what better way to talk about the Piney Wood School than to bring in uh, the man who's running the place right now, and, and Dr. Will Crossley joins us now. Man, it's good to see you. 
It's great to see you. I'm going to get out of the way because there's so many superlatives I could give to you <laughs> and say about your um, incredible journey and just your incredible contribution to the future of America. So let me step out of the way and let you two uh, have at it. Well, I just, I'm going to just turn it over because I've always been, I really think that the best way to convict people to the values and principles is to show them an example of those values in action. And Pinewood School is an example of God's values and the country's values in action. Yeah. And Will would just... Uh, absolutely. So, uh, humbled to be here. Thank you for um, allowing us to be a part of this important celebration. I want to begin by saying thank you um, uh, to you, uh, Ms. Woodson, for your support of our school but also your support of me. Um, I met Bob several years ago, uh, Brenda Gurdon Mitchell, uh, who was a mm -hmm. minister at our church when we were living here in DC, said, you need to meet Bob Woodson. He knows about Piney Woods and he's someone you need to meet. And I'd been in DC for 10 years. So I knew that normally when you go to meet somebody in DC, they have an agenda <laughs> that may be different than yours. And so I went in with a little bit of skepticism and I started talking to Bob and he just started really speaking life into me and the work that I was then doing for Piney Woods. And it was just unbelievable. I left feeling like the work that we attempt to do for young people, speaking life into them, he was doing for me in that moment. And so every time I would come to Washington, I'd send him a note or I'd call him and he'd say, come by, come by, and he'd do it all over again. So I just want to say thank you because I'm able to do what I do because you and people like you uh, speak life into me. So thank you um, on this uh, 40th anniversary um, uh, that thank you celebrate you. today. Yeah. So Pineywood School, we are the nation's longest serving historically African-American uh, boarding prep school. Uh, we serve young people from across the country uh, who uh, come to us in rural Mississippi. Uh, we exist um, on uh, a small plot of about 2,000 acres of land uh, outside of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, where this work happens. And um, we were started, uh, Kathy Hughes' grandfather, uh, actually started our work, uh, Lawrence C. Jones. And um, he started our work for the same reason we do that work today, because we believe in our children. We believe in what they're capable of and what they can do. And every single day, we remind them that they don't yet know the potential that they have, that they literally have the potential to change the world. And so we go through that every single day. We say that we educate the head, the hands, and the heart of every young person, right? Uh, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt said, um, you know, if you only educate the mind and not educate in morals, you will create a menace to society. And so we don't just, we don't just educate for academic performance, although we do, and our students do extraordinarily well and go to college, at 100% of our young people go on to college. We also believe in educating the hands, and so we believe in a strong work ethic, right? We believe that if we build a strong work ethic in young people, they will go out and uh, they will, that will carry them through life. It will help them build perseverance and tenacity and all of those things that you need to be successful in life. And then we educate the heart. Um, we are not ashamed to say we are a Christian institution. Um, we invite all to come in, but they must know they're coming to a Christian community, right? Christianity is not a, a bar over which people must, must jump to get to us, <laughs> right? Um, but it is, the moral, it is the moral authority that we use to make decisions and to govern our campus. Right. And so um, and so we do that every single day. And um, I was just telling Julia, um, Bob, uh, as I was coming in, that I, I was at the University of Virginia this morning. We were talking about um, moral education, Institute for Advanced Studies there. And I, and I, so I was reminded of a student that uh, came to Piney was 30 years ago, 
he invited us to come to the Virgin Islands and visit with them. And as he toured us around the Virgin Islands, he told me and my wife, she's here tonight, told me and my wife, he said, you know, Piney Woods made us go to church three days a week. <laughs> and I never forgot that, he said. And he said, I never had been to church before I came to Piney Woods. Mm. But he said, now I go, he said, now, you know, I want to be fair. I only go about twice a month. But he said, I go to, to church now because it renews me. It fills me. And that started for me at Piney Woods School. And so the environment in which we raise our children matters in, to the people that they become. And so those are some of the things that we believe at the Piney Woods School. Well, we're just delighted that we, at, at the Woodson Center, we try to partner with people who, whose, whose values align with our own because the way that we can convict people to policies is show them the living example. And, uh, and our goal with Piney Wood is to get you endowed. And uh, we're gonna be taking steps in that direction. We wanna take care of ourselves, but also we want to feed you too. Because I really believe that if, uh, if you believe in the standards and principles, then you need to support it with money. And, and so uh, 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 we, we're going to take steps to, to help. Thank you. And partner you with that. And so we're just delighted to, uh, that we'll be at Piney Wood on September the 3rd. Thank you, thank you. Well, we, we welcome you to come. And others who you have introduced to us are on their way to Piney Woods. And so we're just excited to be partners with the Woodson Center. Uh, I absolutely, Lawrence C. Jones, when he started this work, I don't know if he knew what he was doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but again, Bob has been helpful to me and um, I could not have, could not be here um, without what you did when the pandemic hit. Yeah. I, he just called me. Yeah. And he said, we want to bless Piney Woods and the students at Piney Woods. Um, and he proceeded to put the pieces in place to make that happen. And because of the work that he did, because of work Ms. Hughes did, um, in all that same year, we had a record year of fundraising. Yeah. Um, just those two events raised over a million dollars for student scholarships at the Pineywood School. It, it was a great occasion, a momentous occasion in my life during the pandemic to see us be able to accomplish that and to be a part of it and, and to also feature you and the staff and the teachers and the students on, on my own show, uh, dedicating the entire program to Piney Woods, and people are still talking about that today. Uh, and, and Dr. Will Cross, I just want to thank you uh, for thank what you, you're Will. doing as a servant leader there. And of course, going back to Lawrence Jones, yeah, he couldn't have envisioned what he was starting, but he was definitely called to do it. And look what the, the manifestation is. There's a lot of gold coming out of Piney Woods. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're uh, getting towards the end of our program, but since we're talking about Piney Woods, and since we're talking about what Lawrence Jones and Dr. Will Crossley did, uh, and, and it's just an incredible story. I mean, if you, for those of you who are not familiar with the Piney Woods School, make sure you check it out. Uh, Kathy Hughes knows, Bob knows, uh, Will knows, and of course, the students know. So for our final selfie, let's hear from a couple of the students who are now at Piney Woods Good evening, my name is Desmond Bohannon and I'm a senior at the Piney Woods School. Becoming a student has taught me a lot about making friends, better my education, and expressing myself through poetry, art, and dance. Whatever you want to do or be, Piney Woods is 100% behind you and supports you, which is why I enjoy being here at the school. I consider it an honor to have the opportunity to thank our donors for giving to the Piney Woods School. Your donations provide scholarships for students like me and many others who will not be able to attend otherwise. Finally, I would like to say thank you and wish a happy 40th anniversary to the Woodson Center and the donors. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ariana Smith and I am a rising sophomore here at the Piney Woods School. The Piney Woods School has been life-changing from all aspects. It has taught me discipline and morals as well as growth within myself. From the students to the teachers, to administration and dorm faculty, as well as even lunch faculty. 
you can tell the sense of love, home, and welcoming within this environment. Now, I love it at Piney Woods. I really do. And it is only possible or it has been made possible for me to go there by the generous donors who give scholarships to kids like me and many of my other peers. They enable us to live life exponentially every day at the Piney Woods School. Thank you for your generous donations and happy 40th anniversary to the Woodson Center and all the donors. Thank you. Well, Ariana and Desmond, thank you so very much. And to all of the students at Piney Woods and the teachers and the staff, uh, just uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the great work that you're doing there at that academic institution, uh, head, heart, and hands. And, and Bob, this brings us to a close of our program, except with uh, one musical selection and some comments from you about uh, the past 40 years in terms of what you've done with the Woodson Center, but also in terms of how you've impacted uh, people. You know, I, I've always had this statement that the greatness of our nation begins in the homes of its people. Uh, and you've reached out like a modern day Joseph to revolutionize the love that's shared in the homes of our people to change a nation. Any final comments? Yes, I uh, asked my wife and my son Jamal to join me and my daughter Tanya, who is, couldn't be with us, Tanya. Woodson Monastel, she's in Costa Rica, married with a little baby, so she couldn't be here, but I know she wishes she could, and she is in spirit with us. But uh, I just want to say that uh, it's been a fabulous 40-year journey. Uh, I know what the disciples of Jesus must feel like hmm. to walk with people and witness someone hmm. perform miracles because the grassroots leaders that I've been blessed to serve have been miracle workers. And I almost apologized when I write about them because I don't originate anything. I just report on what they do and, and try to interpret what they do. Uh, and it's just been a powerful journey. I wouldn't do anything else but there's a verse that I want to end on and make some other comments. And it's Philippians um, chapter 3, verses 12. That if we walk by experience alone, we will be ruled by our history. I will only reach, I will only reach with things that I can accomplish. When you rely upon God, he opens the door to the unknown of victories in the future. I live at 80 as if I were only 8. If you live by reason alone and stop dreaming, the, is the absence of faith, and you'll be dead when you are alive. Mm. So people wanted to know, how can you at 84 be? I feel as if I am eight in spirit because of the people I've been blessed to serve and the family that I've been blessed with here. But it's been 40 years. I'm 84. It's time for me to step aside. Uh, so within uh, the coming months, I'll become the CEO emeritus. And I'm going to make way for younger leadership. But I, you, you do not, you don't retire. You retire from a job. You expire from a calling. <laughs> <laughs> So, you graduate. Yeah, you graduate to a calling. <laughs> so I'm not really leaving, uh, but I'm uh, stepping aside to make way for more so for sustainability. I want the center to go on for another 40 years. Obvious, I won't be directing it. Uh, but I'm just wanting. But I want to thank my family so much for the support that I, they have given me, and stand by me, even those who disagree with me. <laughs> I'm working on him. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on him. And so again, I, I just want and I'm going to ask um, all of us, my the grassroots leaders and Eric to join me on the stage. Uh, but I want to just thank everybody for blessing my life and allowing me to walk with you and be a part. Let me just say for my son, Rob, who is deceased. He died almost 20 years ago. And I realized 
that when he left here, I was sad and upset. But at his service, the guys standing over here, the bending guys, came into that chapel and surrounded me with smiles on their face. And the message that they were saying to me was, you have 18 other sons to live for. Because I felt like taking my life when my son died. Yeah. But then God sent these young men. That's why they're very special to me. I love you guys because I was with you when you needed me to be with you. But I want you to know you were with me when I needed you to be with me. I love you. I love you. Uh, any brief comments from the family before we uh, close in song? No. I just wanted to say I, I feel that Bob is an amazing man, an amazing husband, uh, an amazing father, and I'm just uh, so proud of all the work you've done, um, hands-on in the community, and uh, we love you, and I love you very much and proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I remember being uh, 10 years old, watching him on TV, being grounded, and I couldn't understand why everyone loved him. And now that I'm 42, it feels great knowing that uh, I'm, I'm watching a real life superhero. And uh, I love you. Thank you. Thanks too much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, uh, for, for being here for the Whitson Center 40th anniversary. And we want to... We want to end this uh, with something that Bob really loves, and it's a, it's a, a spiritual song that he loves. It is well with my soul. And joining us now uh, is Taylor Rand, Kiana Kelly Futch, and Ashley Brown, and they are part of Urban Nation, and they're accompanied, of course, by Ricky Payton, the um, accompanist. Oh, I, have my I just wanted to say I requested this because this is a very special hymn to me. Is because the man who wrote it, as you know, lost his daughters at sea. And he went to the point in the ship where his daughters were in a watery grave 3,000 feet down. But he never looked down, he looked up. And he wrote this, this, uh, this hymn. Just if you were challenged with the death of loved ones, Tyrone, Carl, all of you recently losing people close to all of us have but God wants us to look up and this this song touches my heart and I hope it will touch you the way it has touched me Ricky